Chapter 1. The memory of that tragic day was never to be erased from Rip's mind. The picture of its stunning events was to remain a horrible nightmare in his mind as long as he should live. At midday the boy sat humped on a stool within his uncle's small printing establishment, throwing in type. Watching him, fascinated, was little Beth Prather, daughter of a local storekeeper. She often came to watch him like this, and to marvel at the deft way in which he flicked the type into the small boxes. Silvery-haired Mort Campbell, editor and publisher of the Tejas Searchlight, a four-sheet newspaper, drew on his long, black coat. Going to dinner, son, he said casually, as he quit his pig pen office and headed for the door. His tall, bony form disappeared. A moment later the girl and the boy heard angry voices then two shots pounded out in quick succession. Beth Prather gasped, her eyes on the threshold. They lurched to the opening and the door flew wide open. Rip muttered and froze to a stop. He wheeled off the high stool and rushed down the boardwalk, with figure, lay Rip's uncle Mord. The little girl following at his heels. The editor's soft black hat was crushed unnaturally. One side of his silver-haired head rested against the hard ground, near the curled, ink-stained fingers of the right hand lay the six-gun which the publishing man had been carrying of late. Ten paces beyond the black-coated form stood Ned Dakota, iron-jawed owner of the 4 cage spread, and his son, California. In the ranchman's right fist was a heavy six-shooter, and from its muzzle a faint haze of smoke was oozing, mockingly, it seemed. Ned Dakota deliberately holstered his colt. He was a thick, muscular fellow of forty-six, with a leonine visage and eyes like polished copper. Quick with his gun, quick of temper, powerful of will and of body, he was a prominent figure in local affairs, Tejas had been brutally cruel to young Rip Campbell. His homesteader father had been killed by a horse thief whom Rip had surprised trying to get away with a fine stallion. Rip's ailing mother had died shortly thereafter, chiefly from shock. His uncle had come to the border town and adopted him. Being an experienced publisher of small-town sheets, Mort Rip immediately had launched the Tejas searchlight, and had vigorously, perhaps foolishly, opened a campaign to clean up that Rio Grande hellhole. Most of the editorial shafts had been directed at Dakota and his crowd. Mort Rip had been warned, then threatened. Now the good man who had dared to attack the evils of Tejas almost single-handed was dead. Something like a shuddering sob shook Rip then, rage flaming in his eyes, face pale and fists clenched at his sides. He surged impulsively toward the two Dakotas. The next instant he jerked to a stop. The Leonine ranchman's heavy colt had ripped from leather and was covering him. The boy was unarmed, and he would not have stood a shadow of a chance in a gunfight with Ned Dakota, even if he had been carrying a gun. Rip had never practiced the quick draw. Young Cal Dakota now stepped forward. He was only three years Rip's senior, but he had grown up fast, a strapping, almost man-sized young fellow handsome and arrogant, fast with a six-gun despite his youth he thrust his father aside. With a sneering curl of his lips, cold blue eyes drilling the printer's devil he said, leave him to me, pa. You can't shoot a kid, but me, come on, type tosser, son of a stinking nester. Pick up that cutter your skunk of an uncle dropped and we'll shoot it out, if you ain't yellow. Ungovernable rage swirled within Rip Campbell's breast. Under ordinary circumstances he would have realized that it would be sheer suicide for him, so slow with a pistol, to gunfight young Cal Dakota. But just now the boy was berserk. Uttering a wild, shrill cry like that of a bobcat, he sprang to his uncle's side, stooped and reached a hand for the six-gun which lay at the tips of the curled fingers. Little Beth Prather was of rangeland fighting stock. Her dad once had owned the small rafter 33 spread, but like so many others that ranch had been gobbled by the range greedy Dakotas. Prather then had turned storeman. Now unnoticed by anyone, the girl sprang from the doorway, eyes flashing, and grabbed up a rock. As Rip's reaching fingers touched the old Colt 45 which lay on the ground, Cal Dakota's right hand slapped leather. His gun fairly flew from the holster, tilted upward and roared, but the slug missed Terry Rip by a full yard. With a scream of rage Beth Prather had flung the rock. It had bounced from Cal Dakota's chin and the young gunman's shot had gone wild. The blow had stunned him for an instant. He had dropped his Colt and now was staggering backward. Rip gave Beth an angry glance, as if to ask her why she hadn't minded her own business. Then he shoved his uncle's old frontier model colt under his waistband and went toward Cal Dakota like a rushing bobcat. Cal snarled, lunged at him, swung a fist. Rip neatly sidestepped. As Cal wheeled, the printer's devil smashed him in the nose, swung the other fist in a blow that cracked to the jaw and sat young Dakota down abruptly. Rip gave Cal's gun a kick which sent it scooting far away. White-lipped and fiery-eyed, he turned upon the Dur ranchman. His voice was strained and jerky as he said, Draw, Ned Dakota or I'll shoot you where you stand. 
What a crazy thing to do. He, a kid who knew nothing at all about gunfighting. Ned Dakota, one of the fastest, most feared lead slingers in the whole tough border country. There was no telling what might have come of the boys' rashness, had not there been a babbling of excited voices, a rushing of feet and had not a crowd come pouring around a corner of the little printing establishment. At the forefront of that rushing group was the sheriff. What's this? He demanded gruffly, as human forms swirled about the scene of belligerence. His glance flicked from the dead man to the bloody-nosed Cal Dakota, then back and forth between Ned Dakota and Young Rib. Murder, that's what. The boy fairly yelled. They've been threatening that if Uncle Mort didn't stop his cleanup campaign they'd get him, and now. His voice choked off. He looked at the twisted form on the ground and his shoulders heaved. A volcano was seething inside him at that instant. The kid don't know what he's talking about, Ned Dakota stated coolly. He didn't witness the fight. It was like this me and Campbell had words again. He lost his temper and went for his cutter. It was either me or him, and so, I beat him. Give him two slugs before he could fire a single one, and, there he is. He nodded toward the body. The cold callousness of the explanation, the falsehood, enraged Rip all the more. It's a lie. The dirty, low-down pole cat murdered Uncle Mort in cold blood, I tell you. Ned Dakota went on calmly. The boy has gone loco. He knocked Cal down when my son wasn't doing a thing, then he threatened to shoot us both. You got here just in time to keep me from having to cold conk him. Beth Prather, shoved back a considerable distance by the crowding men, had not been able to hear what Dakota had said, or she doubtless would have screamed that he had lied. Here, give me that hogleg, the sheriff demanded gruffly, and he snatched the six-shooter from Rip's waistband. The lad struggled to regain possession of the weapon, but the officer collared him away. At last Rip desisted, but he was still enraged. He glared about, asked huskily. Why don't somebody do something? Are you going to let Ned Dakota get away with this new killing? Young Cal Dakota now bit out, he took me by surprise a minute ago, Sheriff. Besides, I was still dazed from being hit on the chin with a rock thrown by Beth Prether. Give him back his cutter, and turn him loose. I'll beat the devil out of him with my fists, then shoot him to doll rags in a man-to-man -man gunfight. There was no doubt at all that he could have done both these things. He was older, bigger and stronger than Rip and he was very fast on the draw for one of his age. Shut up the fight talk, all of you. Rapped the sheriff. Then he turned and said gently to Rip, better go down and talk to the undertaker about the funeral. I'll arrange for an inquest. He gave the boy a shove. Come along to my office, you Dakotas, he ordered. I want to ask you some questions. Ned Dakota nodded unconcernedly. His big face was as expressionless as a lump of rock. But there was a sneering smile on Cal Dakota's lips as he followed the officer. Dazedly, Rip headed for the undertaker's establishment. As he did so his stricken gaze turned toward the print shop, and met that of the little girl. She now stood in the doorway, the better to see what was going on. She was an angry figure in pigtails and gingham. Her small back was stiff and her arms were akimbo. Her lips were tight, her brown eyes blazing. The freckled face was alternately red, then pale. Rip's agonized gaze brought her quickly to him. Why didn't the sheriff let you finish them off? The murderers, she demanded. He looked away, his face stony, and mumbled, I guess he saved me from being killed, at that. Both Ned and Cal Dakota can outdraw me by a mile, truth is, Beth, I'm no draw kid at all. Never figured I'd have to shuck a hog leg in a hurry, so I've never practiced. She softened, then, took one of his hands in both her own. You're right, Rip. They would've killed you, too. I'm glad. Her voice choked off and streaks of brine coursed swiftly down the plump, freckled cheeks. Her sympathy brought a change of emotion surging up within Rip Campbell. Tears rushed to his eyes, for he was but a lad of fourteen. He did not wish to be unkind, but he did not want his little friend to see him cry, so he pushed her away. With teeth gritted so hard that his jaws ached, he walked rapidly away down the street. The sheriff did not hold the Dakotas for the shooting of Mort Campbell. Since they were the only witnesses to the tragic affair he had to accept their version of the killing. The body was taken to the coroner's office, and there in the afternoon an inquest was held. The verdict was the inevitable. Justifiable homicide self-defense. Ned Dakota had killed again and got away with it. The graves of Rip's parents were out in the quiet hills where once had been the Rip homestead, but which land was now a part of the great 4-H ranch. The lad arranged to have his uncle buried out there also promising the undertaker that he would pay for the funeral with proceeds from the sale of the little printing establishment. Ruthless evildoers were not yet through dealing the boy grief, however. Up in the Crazy Horse Saloon four men planned the destruction of the print shop. If we don't, growled Ned Dakota, 
it may fall into the hands of some other crank who will likewise get a notion it's his God-ordained duty to clean up the neighborhood. Yes, agreed the sleek owner of the crazy horse, we'd better wipe the slate clean while we're at it. Shortly thereafter the place went up in flames and smoke. The type was melted and the little hand press rendered useless. Even Rip Campbell's personal belongings were lost, save for what he had on his back. He and his uncle had made their home in the rear part of the building. This new blow left the boy utterly crushed. He was too dazed even to shed tears or to rage. He simply stood, hands clenched inside his pants pockets, staring like an amnesia victim while the print shop burned. The crowd watched him silently, pityingly for the most part. When it was over, when there remained of the printing establishment only a bed of embers and some fire-blackened, useless equipment, Rip turned slowly and walked uptown. His gaze was upon the ground, moving like a person in a dream. He turned to the undertaker's office. You see how it is, he stated dully. I can't pay now, but I will, someday. I promise. That heartless, cadaverous buzzard said callously, Hell, kid, you can't expect me to stand the expense of the burial. How could you pay, before a good many years, anyhow? And you ain't got any folks to help you out. Nah, if this is to be a charity burying, let the county handle it. And so Mort Rip was given a pauper's funeral. The body was not laid to rest beside those of Rip's parents, as the boy had wished. It was planted on the town's boot hill, amidst the graves of all sorts of border evildoers and gunmen. Just as darkness was falling Rip went to the sheriff and said, I'd like to get Uncle Mort's 45. I've talked with them covered wagon folks who are driving up into central New Mexico, and they've agreed to take me with them. They say chances are mighty good up there. The sheriff nodded sympathetically. I reckon it'll be a heap better for you in that country than here, son. Then he gave the youth a keen look. But you ain't by any chance thinking of using that cutter before you leave Tejas? On one or both of the Dakotas, I mean? The grim-faced kid was silent, apparently deeply thoughtful for a moment, and then slowly he wagged his head. Nope, I've got gumption enough to realize I wouldn't have a chance with either of them in a stand-up gunfight, and I'm no dry gulcher. I won't give them the pleasure of getting me like they did my uncle. He'll wait and get ready. Then someday I'll come back and kill them both, shoot hell out of this whole gust, crooked town. He had lashed out the last few words fiercely. Now his jaws were set hard his eyes were bleak, deadly. The sheriff got up and laid a hand on the lad's shoulder. In a voice of gruff kindness he said, Get such poisonous thoughts out of your mind, son, they're what make outlaws and killers. Without another word, then, he brought Mort Campbell's old frontier model cult and ammunition belt. Rip buckled on the weapon and pulled the leather tongue of the belt to the last notch. Even so, the outfit sagged almost ludicrously from his slim waist. Mort had a few dollars on him, but he owed some bills and, yeah, I know. I'll get along. Them covered wagon folks say I can work for my keep. As he walked out the sheriff called after him, So long, kid, in case I don't see you again before the covered wagon outfit pulls out in the morning. Rip spoke not a word in reply. He just walked away into the gathering darkness. Chapter 2 Rip returned to his uncle's grave. It was a silent farewell. The wagon train was to hit the trail at dawn and there scarcely would be time for him to visit Boot Hill in the morning. The western horizon was flushed. Elsewhere there was purple gloom. The moon came up and dispelled some of it. The stars were cold, unpitying eyes, looking down upon him. The lights of the tough border town glowed in stolid indifference to his grief. Standing bareheaded beside a fresh mound and amidst a small field of rude crosses, headstones, boards, rip, for the first time since the untimely death of his uncle, surrendered to his bitter grief. Unashamed. Without restraint, he wept. After the tears, came once more a cold, fierce resolve which hardened his heart and aged his young face by at least four years. A light touch upon an arm startled him. He wheeled, and found himself looking down into Beth Prather's big, dark eyes. They were sympathetic, brimming with tears, those eyes. The freckled face held infinite pity, and the soft lips trembled. Her voice was half a sob as she said. Daddy would be mad if he knew I'd slipped away up here, alone. But I wanted to say goodbye to you, and I likely won't be up when the wagons take the trail in the morning. For a while, then, neither said anything. He was looking away toward the horizon, and there were little pinched lines about his eyes. His throat seemed to be cracking inside. I guess I'd better be going now, she prompted finally. You, you'll come back sometime? He nodded emphatically. Yeah, someday I'm coming back and shoot hell out of Tejas. The fierce bitterness in his voice, the look on his face caused her to underscore stare in awe. Goodbye, Rip, she whispered after a moment. His gaze remained on the horizon. 
His face lost none of its cold hardness. Goodbye, Beth, he echoed. Inwardly he was struggling to control his emotions, but how was she to know? Again her lips trembled. Tiptoeing suddenly, she pulled his head down to her and kissed him, then she wheeled and fled into the night. He made a move as if to call her back, but changed his mind. He relaxed and a fatalistic expression settled upon his young face. He turned and walked slowly back to town. His hands were in his pockets, his eyes on the ground. He did not know where his feet were carrying him, did not care. He was absorbed in his own grief and somber thoughts. After a while, though, a thumping of boarding underfoot told him that he was back on Main Street. Suddenly he felt an impact. He caromed onto the dirt, almost fell. Then he righted himself and looked around. Cal Dakota was standing on the board sidewalk, gazing at him sneeringly. The boy gunman said, Why don't you watch out where you're going, you flea-bitten pup? You should step aside when you meet up with your betters. If you had the guts to draw I'd give you what your skunky uncle got. Rip should have realized that Cal Dakota had planned to shoot him in reprisal for the smashed nose and the knockdown, but in that instant the printer's devil had no sense of reasoning. He had dearly loved his uncle, and to hear such words of defamation from young Dakota seemed to cause the boy's brain to explode. He simply went mad. All right, Cal Dakota, he choked out quiveringly, I'm calling you. They went for their guns at the same instant, but even though surprised, Cal easily beat the gun clumsy type slinger by a wide margin. The report of his cult seemed to jar the whole town. Realizing how hopelessly he was being outsped, Rip had lunged aside. The bullet zipped past his back. Cal fired again. But Rip had tripped and was falling. It was a lucky break for him that he did so. The accident caused Dakota to miss a second time. Rip had at last got his own gun free and into action. It bucked in his grasp and flame stabbed from its muzzle just as he struck the ground. The chance shot was lucky. It sent Cal Dakota stumbling backward. The next instant the handsome young villain was down, and the back of his head struck hard against a rock doorstep. Rip scrambled to his feet and stared. Cal lay, a crumpled figure, blood running from his face and pooling on the sidewalk. The boy now became aware that doors were flying open that people were swarming onto the street. There were shouts, and a pounding of boots. Shadows were flitting within the areas of dim light along Main Street. Someone yelled, It's the Campbell boy in Cal Dakota. Cal is down. He's been shot. Look at the gun in Rip's hand. And then the bellowing voice of Ned Dakota came from farther down the street. The damned little rat. He's murdered my son. Must have cut down on him when he wasn't looking, you all know he couldn't outgun Cal in fair fight. Get him. Don't let him escape. Wildly Rip's brain worked. He told himself that if he stayed there and faced it out he would not have a chance. He was alone in the world now, had no friends in the town. Tejas hated him, the lad reasoned swiftly, because he had helped his uncle combat its evils. Ned Dakota was powerful, and violent. No, I wouldn't have a chance, he told himself again. I've got to get out of this town tonight. All his hopes of joining up with the covered wagon outfit in the morning had to be abandoned. Like a startled jackrabbit, the boy darted across the sidewalk and into a dark opening between two buildings. Behind him sounded the roar of the crowd as it took up the pursuit. Like pack wolves eager for blood, were those excited, whiskey-fired men. It was a breathtaking game of chase which followed. Rip had got into the chaparral, and riders charged up and down through the thorny scrub in search of him. Several times he was almost trampled upon as he lay hidden in the brush. He kept eluding the pursuers, however and finally escaped across the Rio Grande and into Mexico. Standing on a knoll on the Chihuahua side he looked back at the lights of Tejas. Like devil eyes they were to him just now, foiled and sullen devils. He thought of all that the Rips had suffered back there in that country, his father murdered by a horse thief, his mother's death chiefly from shock, the gunning out of his crusader uncle, his own troubles. Buzzard roost. He muttered between set teeth. Wolf range. Hangout place for snakes and vinegar ones. Town of Tejas. Someday I'm coming back and shoot hell out of you, and the Dakota crowd in particular. I won't be a young one I. No sir, you'll find out. Half starved, footsore and weary from many miles of hiking, Rip put in at a little goat ranch. With a shrewd out of business the Mexican proprietor gave him a job as herdsman, the pay, his keep. The boy learned from a passerby that Cal Dakota had not been killed, merely face wounded. It was bullet shock, and the blow on the back of the head when he had struck a doorstep that had left him sprawled as if dead. Life to young Rip Campbell had become one of hell, goat herding, sheep tending, swamping and cantinas, other such hateful menial labor. But he kept his chin up and endured it all without a murmur against the vicissitudes of life. On and on he wandered, moving whenever circumstances permitted. 
In the tough places he saw men fight, saw men die, came in contact with many fast hombres. He took careful note of their fighting technique, and practiced, practiced, practiced. When finally he had saved up enough money to buy a pony and a riding outfit, he turned to the cattle ranches for employment. At first he worked only as flunky, or wrangler. But it was not long before he had become a full-fledged vaquero. In that bandit-infested country below the border a cowboy was called upon to use his hardware frequently, accurately, swiftly. Rip began to gain notoriety as a cool-nerved and speedy cult man, at last he came into the employ of a big outfit which had for its segundo a lanky Texan who once had been a famous quick-draw ranger. By this time the one-time printer boy known as Rip, a cold-eyed, taciturn cowboy with lightning in both hands, steel wires for nerves. One day he held a gun practice within a rocky bowl five miles from the home rancho. He finished fanning empty a six-shooter, then turned. He started when he saw old Lou Cayley, the segundo, sitting humped on a small boulder and watching him. Rip's lean face hardened, but the lanky ex-ranger smiled amiably, spat tobacco juice at a horned toad, and remarked, That's right pert gunning, cowboy. As slick as ever I see. Rip did not reply. His face was cold and haughty. He walked over to the segundo, squatted on spurred heels, and began punching out warm shells. When he had finished reloading the gun he shoved it away, then rolled and lighted a cigarette. Finally Lou drawled with refreshing candor. I got sorta of suspicious of you, Rip, account you're slippin' away alone into the hills so frequent, so did they I followed you. Rip Campbell said nothing, just waited for the leathery puncher to go on. Lou did so, in his own good time. So this is why you do it, huh? Secret gun practice. How come, if I may inquire? Another long silence. Rip liked the hard-bitten ex-ranger a great deal. Moreover, he suddenly had decided upon an experiment. And so he told his story. He told it bitterly, harshly, in all its sordid, soul-crushing detail. Told why he had studied and practiced throughout the years, to reach the ultimate in gun skill. When the young cowboy had finished, wise old Luke Haley nodded soberly. I think I savvy just how you feel, Rip. Had a setup something like yours myself once. He closed his right eye cocked the left brow and asked half humorously. But why keep up the practice? Gosh, don't you figure your gun slick enough already? Rip rose off spurred heels, with the light grace of a lazy cat getting up from a nap. That's what I wanted to find out right now. Are you as fast with your cutter as you were while in the ranger service, Lou? There was a strange glitter in his eyes, a funny ghost of a hard smile on his thin lips. The old timer grinned and scratched his uncombed head. Well, now I reckon the years have slowed me down some. Still, I figure I'm plenty fast enough to match the gun speed of any young squirt I run. Up again. His eyes twinkled as he looked at Rip Campbell. The young cowboy laughed. All right, you longhorn, get onto your feet inside me. We'll face yonder hackberry tree. I'll throw a rock high in behind me. When it clashes against the rebel we'll both draw and fire. I'm curious to see if I can beat you. And I'm betting you a doby dollar you can, challenged Lou, as he got up and moved to the young cowboy's side. Called. Rip picked up a rock. Are you ready? Let her buck. Rip Campbell threw the stone backward. Lou's stringy body jerked into a tense crouch. The cowboy's athletic form seemed relaxed. The next instant the stone struck and the gun race was on. Rip's right wrist just seemed to twitch, the thumb to flip like a released spring. His gun barked well ahead of the Segundo's long-barreled 45. Both bullets whacked solidly into the trunk of the hackberry tree. Lou grinned a bit sheepishly. You beat me, all right. Guess I ain't as fast as I thought I was. Rip's gray eyes were hard and bright. There was an eager look on his thin fleshed face. He thrust his right gun away, slapped the one on his left hip. This was the old Frontier model Colt which he had brought out of Tejas, his uncle's gun. Now I'll use this one, give you a chance to win your peso back. Rip picked up another rock. Set? Turn the critter loose. Again a rock went hurtling, struck again two six-shooters barked, but this time the reports came as one. Old Lou Cayley grinned broadly. Matched you that time, young feller. Rip Campbell nodded. His smile was one of complete satisfaction. Yep, but I was shooting with my left hand, and using the long barrel gun. Meaning what? Let's squat again and I'll explain. Seated on boulders they again rolled cigarettes. Then Rip spoke in a matter-of-fact way. Throwing in type when I was a kid, the constant flick flick flicking, gave me a fast right hand, only I didn't realize it until later. I might have been quick with a cutter even then, with a little practice. I've made a close study of this gun business, Lou, and I've eliminated a great deal of waste motion, taken the slack out of the rope, so to speak. 
Meaning? Well, consider your case for instance. You, like a good many other local pistoliers, wear your colt with the butt forward. Say, Sprout, you can't beat the older border cross draw. Oh, yes I can I've just done it. Does it make sense that a man can carry his right hand from right hip joint to left hip joint, as quick as he can flick it from thigh to butt of a cutter it's already nearly touching? Lou rubbed his bony chin. No, I reckon it don't. Of course not. And now for the long-barreled guns. I've noticed the one you carry on the right is short, and I've wondered. And for good reason. It's only about half as long as yours, therefore requires only half the amount of lift to clear it of leather. Split seconds, old timer, all these things I've worked out, but split seconds mean the difference between life and death in a gunfight. My short gun is for speed. It has no range, but the heavy caliber lead will smash a bull down at close quarters. For longer range I use the other Colt, or a rifle. He drew the stubby six gun and turned it over in his hands, spoke like a scientist who has achieved something from long study. I've filed trigger and cocking dogs away. Now all I have to do to shoot is just flip the hammer with my thumb. Faster than cocking and triggering, eh? Nothing new there. I. And the gun has no sight. That, too, has been filed off. Likewise old stuff. The holster has been cut away, leaving just enough leather to hold the six gun secure. That shortens the length of the rise. Also, when I slap hardware my trigger finger slips right into the guard, and my thumb onto the hammer. Some more old stuff. Right again. I've studied the gun tricks of others, adopted the things that are good, added some of my own. What about the swivel holster? No bueno. It's fast, but in real gun company it's suicidal. If your opponent leaps aside, which he will if he's gun wise, you have to turn your whole body in order to bring him within your line of fire again. Um em, I hadn't thought of that. The wiry young puncher drew on his cigarette, blew smoke through his straight nose. Then he added, I've considered my hands, too. Exercise them a lot to make them quick and sure. I figured that a master gunman's fingers should be like a master musician's. Old Lou eyed him sideways, though while tugging absently at the long mustache that horned down each side of his bony chin. Rip, danged if your talk ain't plum revealing. You've been a sort of fanatic about this gun training business, ain't you? A feller would get the idea that you studied and practiced to become a regular cult hellion. Rip nodded soberly. And such I did. I swore I'd go back to Tejas someday and shoot hell out of the whole place. I knew I'd have to be mighty well prepared, for the hammers, and others, are fast with their hardware. Tejas is tough, Lou, very, very tough. But so am I, now. There was a grim smile on his lips. He was looking away toward the border, and once more the gray eyes were hard and shiny. He resumed slowly. Now, though, I see things different. I realize that the underscore town ain't all bad. Mostly good people there, but the bad ones keep them buffaloed. And so? I aim to use my gun learning only to help the decent element clean up the town. A gleam of approval showed in Luke Haley's hard brown eyes. Your first idea was the kind that makes outlaws and killers, Rip Campbell. Now, though, you're talking sense. He spat at the dozing horned toad again. Squinted one eye, he said calculatingly. If need be, I can rustle us a couple ranger badges. Us? Lou grinned, jerked his head in a nod. I've been honing to go back to the old stomping ground for a right smart while. Never should have left it to take on this here job that promised so much. Besides, I'd just love to help do some cleaning up around Tejas. A mighty good pal of mine was dry gulch down there once. Rip's teeth flashed in a smile, a startling row of white in a berry brown face. He thrust out a slim hand that was as strong as spring steel. Shake partner. We're hitting the trail for the Rio in the morning. Then once more he turned his face eastward. The gray eyes glinted and a devilish ghost of a smile played about the thin lips. In an undertone he said, look out, Tejas, and the Dakota crowd in particular. We're coming. Chapter 3 It was high noon of a fine spring day when Rip Campbell and Luke Haley splashed their way across the shallow Rio Grande and mounted the shore on the Texas side. They drew rein, hipped around in their saddles and looked back. Somber were the stretches of Chaparral, dreary were the gray hills that rose in the distance. Both men were glad at last to be out of Chihuahua. They straightened themselves in their saddles and gazed ahead they glanced at each other and both grinned. Seems sort of good to be back in old Texas, huh? Observed Lou. It sure does. If it wasn't I know doggone well I'm going to have plenty of trouble over here, I'd feel as cheerful as that mockingbird which is spilling notes all over the top of that big cottonwood over yonder. Lou chuckled and twisted an end of his long mustache. They touched spurs gently to their bronx and went on up the trail. After a while Lou remarked, Gosh, 
Look at the birds. Rip's eyes had been fixed moodily upon the ground, as he thought of the situation awaiting him under Tejas. Now he lifted his gaze to the sky. A big flock of pigeons was coming out of the east, and rocketing toward Mexico. Snow white, they showed against the blue of the heavens. Pretty, ain't they? said Lou. Yeah, but they haven't got much gumption. They're leaving a doggone sight better country than they're going into. They ought to turn around and head back. The pigeons flew on, and disappeared in the distance. After a moment Rip Campbell said in a detached way, For ten years I've been telling myself that I hated Texas, but now I know I don't, that I never did, really. But when a little later they sat their mounts on a rise and looked down upon the town of Tejas, bitterness and sad memories returned to the young cowboy's heart. He took a deep breath, said between lips that were drawn tightly over his teeth, Well, there she is, partner. Tejas, hellhole, wolf den, breeding place for snakes and skunks unless she's changed in the last ten years. Maybe she has changed, and maybe them Dakotas ain't even in these parts anymore. You can bet they are, Rip said grimly. They own the biggest spread in the country, and just about rotted things, both on the range and in town. Yeah, they're still here, all right. They wouldn't leave such a nice setup. They were grabbing right and left, they more than likely own about half the country by this time. Old Lou twisted his mustache and studied the town. A nest of mingled plank and adobe structures, it sprawled within a flat little valley. Chaparral and mesquite surrounded the place. Rip's eyes were hard, his tanned young face moody, as he stared upon Tejas. After a while he said musingly, that little knoll over there to the north of town, that's the public cemetery, Tejas's boot hill. My uncle is buried there. He was planted among thieves, renegades, and gunmen, because I didn't have the money to pay for a decent burial. Someday I'll have the remains dug up and taken over yonder. He nodded toward a peaceful looking range of rolling hills. My father and my mother rest there. Shucks, Rip, forget it, Lou told him gently. I wouldn't think of disturbing that grave if I was you. What's there is only dust and clay, you know. If what we all like to believe is true, your uncle and your parents are already together, on another range. The bodies they occupied while on this earth don't matter. Rip said nothing. He touched his mount with the rowels and headed down the slope. Throughout the years Rip had thought frequently of little Beth Prather, had thought of her tenderly. He recalled how they had parted, that childish, impulsive kiss, her bitter sobbing as she had fled into the gloom. At the moment it had seemed to him that she was his only friend in all the world. He wondered if she were still in Tejas. Wondered what she was like, grown to young womanhood. As he and Lou entered town his eyes eagerly sought out the false front of the big plank building which had been her father's store. As his gaze riveted upon the sign painted across that frame face attention seized him and involuntarily he pulled to a stop. The familiar old sign was gone, and in its place was one which read. Hammer's General Store. And the Dakotas gobbled that, too, the grim-faced cowboy mumbled. Huh? What you saying? Asked Lou, but Rip paid no heed. They moved slowly on. This big store always had been a favorite hangout for loafers. The large porch offered shade, and there were benches against the wall. Moreover, out front was a giant cottonwood, and beneath this was the town pump and watering trough. That mossy trough, and the porch edge, and the benches all were worn and knife-nicked. Rip Campbell saw at once that there was a small crowd at the old loafing place. It was Saturday afternoon, and a good many people were in town. Men eyed him and Luke Haley curiously as they foxtrotted their broncos along the street. Bitterness, a flare of devilish recklessness carried Rip straight underscore toward Dakota's store. Dax Bradwell owner of the Crazy Horse Saloon, and others of the Dakota crowd were there. He was curious to see if they would recognize him what they would do if they did know him. Several of those men had been in the mob which had chased him into Mexico ten years before. Well, just let them try to chase him now. As he and Lou swung down and left their reins trailing over the hitch rail, the wiry young cowboy received another shock one that jarred him to the very toes of his glove-fitting boots. A girl and a big, handsome man came out of the store, each with an armful of packages. The couple were smiling, and lively banter was passing back and forth between the two. Rip Campbell's heart went a little sick. The girl, he recognized as Beth Prather. The man was Cal Dakota. What were those one-time enemies doing in each other's company? And apparently in such happy mood. The years hadn't made a great deal of change in young Dakota, for he had been practically grown the last time Rip had seen him. He now had an ugly sear across his left cheek, hated memento of the gunfight with Rip ten years before. What young Rip was to find out later, was that Cal Hammer was super sensitive about that scar. 
In the first place, it humiliated him because it was evidence that he had been taken by his adversary, a gangling kid who knew practically nothing about a six-gun. In the second place, Cal believed that the scar marred his good looks, and he had always been quite vain about that arrogantly handsome face of his. Rip Campbell had found himself suddenly confronted by the couple. Now they and he stopped abruptly. His eyes and Beth Prather's met and held. Hers took on a strangely intent light. Had she recognized him? Cal Dakota was staring, too, but his gaze was merely curious and coldly commanding. Rip exulted inwardly. He had been but fourteen when he had fled Tejas. He had known that the passing years had brought a very great change in him. He had hoped that he would not be recognized when he returned, and now it seemed that the hope was realized. The intent look was gone from Beth's eyes. Apparently she had failed to recognize him. He mumbled, pardon me, folks, and stepped aside. The couple ignored him further, and went on to a buckboard. They loaded in the packages, mounted to the seat, and drove away, Cal Dakota at the reins. As the buckboard departed Rip heard a tinkling little laugh, and he cursed inwardly as he saw the way in which Beth Prather was looking up into her companion's face. Again he asked himself how in the world it was that they were together like that friends even lovers, perhaps. Life sure is funny, he thought glumly. What a beautiful girl Beth Prather had become. Gone were the freckles, the pigtails, the skinny limbs. Her cheeks now were soft and clear. Her hair was bobbed, wavy, a rich chestnut brown. Her trim figure had the beautiful, firm roundness of splendid young womanhood. Her eyes were large and dark and luminous. She's going to help him prepare the ranch house for that fiesta tonight, Rip heard one of the loafers say. Seems they're right stuck on each other, another observed. Surprising, too, they were such enemies when kids. The first loafer then made a smutty remark. Some of the others laughed. Anger swept like wildfire through Rip's breast. A few quick strides that caused boot heels to crack against planking and spur rowels to ring, and he was before the loose-mouthed fellow. As the man looked up into the glittering gray eyes a look of mingled wonder and dismay flashed across his gross face. Rip slapped a brown hand onto the fellow's shoulder twisted the steel spring fingers into the unbuttoned collar, and jerked the man erect. It was a surprising display of strength for one of Rip's size. The cowboy weighed but a hundred and sixty pounds. His words seemed to pop from his tight lips as he said, Fella, I ain't used to hearing smutty remarks passed about a nice young lady like that. Eat your dirty words, or I'll slam them. Right down your throat, and some teeth along with them. He remembered the scoundrel from his boyhood days, a gunny for the Dakota Bradwell crowd. The scoundrel blinked in amazement, and then his heavy face went dark red in anger. With a snarl he tore the hand from his collar and struck. Rip's move was as quick as that of an alert bobcat as he sidestepped. The blow slid harmlessly over his right shoulder. He chugged out his right fist in a blow that traveled only a few inches. It smashed against the man's loose lips and sent him staggering back over worn boot heels. The next instant the two men were mixing it in a furious slugfest. The other men of that little crowd all had started to their feet. Old Luke Haley slapped a bony hand to his holster and warned, Don't nobody get funny ideas. I'm backing my partner's play. Stand back, you moss horns, give them room and let them have it out. They glanced at him, then gave back and fixed their attention upon the two combatants. Rip's opponent outweighed him by a healthy margin, but the lithe young puncher fought like a buzzsaw. He recognized in this loose-mouthed ruffian one of Ned Dakota's pet gunmen. Moreover, the remark which the fellow had just made about Beth Prather was still burning within the cowboy's brain. He smashed a blow to the nose, bringing a gushing flow of crimson. The man snorted a red spray, roared in anger, ducked his head, and charged. The sheer ferocity of that rush carried Drip Campbell backward, fists flailing. A blow came out of nowhere, a wild swing with no science or sense of direction behind it, but it landed to the face, nevertheless. Rip went hurtling backward, slammed hard against the fore wall of the store. A howl of encouragement went up from the crowd. Dax Bradwell, sleek owner of the Crazy Horse Saloon, yelped excitedly. That's the stuff, Tessie, knock his head off. And Tessie tried. Bloody lips grinning, little eyes gleaming fiercely, he rushed again. Rip Campbell's wiry body seemed to flip like a released spring. That lithe form went hurtling forward, faded aside at the last split second. A big fist fairly whistled past his head. His own right arm pistoned and his rock-hard right fist sank almost wrist deep into the other man's belly. The fellow let out a wump, and jackknifed suddenly at the middle. His eyes were bugged as he doubled his face was pasty and contorted in pain. Rip spun on the balls of his feet, whipped a left to the jaw. The next instant he was beating his foe backward with a veritable hailstorm of short, jolting blows. He stopped suddenly, 
Then his whole wiry body threw itself into a flying right. The crack of fist against the loose jaw could be heard on the other side of the street. The 4 cage man was spun half around. He seemed to dive off the porch edge, and the heavy body struck with a scuffing thud. Rip Campbell strode swiftly to the trough. He dipped up a hatful of water, came back and splashed it into the bloody, bruised face. The ruffian gasped and sputtered. Rip collared him erect. Eat the dirty words you said, or I'll slam you again, he threatened. Again the fellow snarled and pulled away, and this time he cut a hand toward his six-gun. Instantly Rip was upon him. The cowboy's Colt 45 snapped from leather and flicked downward. The blue barrel cracked against Desi's knuckles. With a howl of pain the fellow let go his six-shooter and it fell to the ground. Campbell kicked it away. All right. All right. Desi now spoke hurriedly. I, I leap crow. I take it all back. I'm sorry I said. Get out. Rip ordered. Plumb out of town. The fellow nodded submissively. He retrieved his six-gun, then went clumping away toward a hit track, wiping blood and muttering between swollen lips. Rip holstered his gun and stepped back onto the porch. Dax Bradwell now came forward and confronted the cowboy. He was a slender, immaculate man in store clothes. The face was cold and haughty, the eyes black and full of the devil. His voice was challenging as he said. Who are you, cowboy, you and this long-legged maverick, to come here and try to run this town? Once more fierce, reckless anger swirled within Rip Campbell. Here was one of Ned Dakota's closest allies, one of the men responsible for the murder of Mort Campbell, and the burning of the little printing establishment ten years ago. This man had been at the forefront of the mob which had chased a desperate kid through the chaparral and into Mexico. One of the crowd that had been responsible for all Rip Campbell had suffered. Rip's thin lips twisted in a sneering grin. Mockingly he said, that long-legged Jasper is one of the old Shikuger's brothers. Me, I'm the wolf with the wire tail. Then the lips went flat, the mouth took on a mean droop and he added between set teeth, keep your nose out of my business, hombre, or it might get caved in. A tense silence fell. Men began to clear back. Dax Bradwell was not one to take such talk as this, and he was a flash with his hardware. At first, however, he elected to use a fist rather than a gun. He was possessed of a volcanic temperament, and now he cursed and struck out impulsively. Rip elbowed the blow aside, carried his fist on and landed it to the chin. It was a short blow, but it sent Bradwell stumbling back. The haughty, immaculate dive owner ordinarily was distinctively averse to fist fighting, considering it beneath his dignity. It had been a wild flare of temper which had caused him to swing that one blow. Now with hell flaring in his black eyes he spat out, Damn you, cowboy, draw. His right hand swept back an edge of his black coat and seized the handle of a pistol, but the weapon froze halfway out of its holster. A cat-like leap, and Rip Campbell was boring the saloon man's belly with the muzzle of a very short colt. How that gun had got into the brown fist was a mystery to some of the onlookers. They had not seen the hand move. Carrying the slim gambler gunman on the muzzle of his 45, Rip shoved Dax Bradwell backward to the wall and pinned him there. And now he held Bradwell, the whole crowd, plenty. When he was through he shoved the gun away, wheeled, and he and Lou Cayley went high heeling down the street. Old Lou chuckled. That was telling them off, cowboy. But the next moment he was frowning worriedly. Don't you think, though, it's bad business, starting right in with a scrap? I wasn't going to let the blabbering mouth get away with his dirty talk, Rip retorted. That was Beth Prather, the girl you've heard me speak of so often. Besides, he added grimly, we might as well show our brands right in the beginning. The best way to handle toughs is to be tough yourself, just a little bit tougher than the other fella. They went up to where once had stood Mort Campbell's print shop. The lot had been sold by the creditor bank. On it now stood an adobe building across the face of which was painted. Hammer's Dance Hall. Young Campbell was sad and bitter as he turned away. He was soon to learn that Cal Dakota and Beth Prather had not yet left Ahas. He and Lou were passing a building when suddenly the couple came out, their arms again loaded with packages. Evidently they had put in here for Fiesta supplies which the Dakota store did not carry. Once more all hands stopped. Once more Rip Campbell found Beth Prather studying him intently. Cal Dakota was gazing steadily at him, too, and he wondered if the man had heard of the trouble which had occurred down the street a short time before. The cold blue eyes and the hard face were utterly inscrutable. Again Rip mumbled an apology and stepped aside. As Cal and Beth were about to drive away in the buckboard the girl inadvertently knocked a package from the seat and it fell to the ground. Instantly Rip went to retrieve it for her. Beth sprang down quickly, but he was first to reach the package. As he handed it to her their eyes met and held once more. A slight flush swept into her soft cheeks. 
She murmured her thanks, Rip glanced at Calhammer again and he saw that the man's face was no longer inscrutable. It was red with anger now, and the eyes were blazing. Evidently he was a very jealous fellow, and Rip Campbell was not at all hard for a girl to look at. Better mind your own business, stranger, Dakota snapped, and don't try to get fresh with the ladies. A devilish impulse seized Rip then. His gray eyes danced and a small, tantalizing smile curled his lips. He put out a hand to Beth Prather, and apparently under the spell of a strange, irresistible fascination she placed her palm against his own. He helped her back into the buckboard. Her gesture had been an unconsciously trusting one, just as if she knew him to be the friend of her childhood. Or did she know? Cal Dakota muttered something under his breath and made a move as if to get out of the vehicle. But the horses had already been turned away from the rail and now Beth reached over and shook the lines. The meddlesome team lunged into the collars and the next instant the wheels were spinning. Rip could see that the girl and the man were arguing. They both looked back. Dakota's expression was ominous, but Beth smiled. Chapter 4 Rip Campbell went to see Aldous Sullivan, an old lawyer who had been a close friend of his publisher uncle. The white-haired, apple-cheeked little man did not recognize him, was surprised and delighted when Rip disclosed his identity. They had a long chat. The Hammers were known only as lead-slinging range gobblers in the old days, Sullivan told the cowboy, but now they're suspected of just about every crime on the calendar. What happened to the old Prather store? Rip asked curiously. Belongs to the Dakotas now. Prather decided to try ranching again, so he traded it for a piece of Dakota range. Reckon they figured they could euchre him out of it later on, like they did once before. Funny thing. Prather was the only person who never believed the Dakotas were the scamps who stole him poor on that first ranch. The poor fellow is dead now. Passed away of slow fever. Beth was away in school, but came back and took charge of the spread. The Hammers have the girl and her mother at their mercy, but haven't squeezed because young Dakota wants Beth. On her part, she seems to have forgotten the past and fallen for California. Rip Campbell was embittered by the news. He growled, I'll get the deadwood on the Dakotas, if it's the last thing I ever do. They were startled by the entrance of a heavy-set, square-jawed man. I'm no eavesdropper, he stated bluntly. Happened I saw the stranger come in here and wanted to ask him some questions about that ruckus he had. I couldn't help hearing what you two said. That's all right, John, the lawyer assured him. Rip, meet John Nelson, the new sheriff. The old one was murdered in the breaks, by rustlers supposedly. John, this is Rip Campbell. Then he said to the cowboy. We'd better confide in him son since he partly knows anyway. And Rip did. John Nelson professed hatred of the Dakotas, they'd turn their dirty hands to anything to make easy money, horse thieving, cow rustling, smuggling, land grabbing, running dives, dealing in crooked politics, yes, anything. I'd give my right arm to be able to land them. I'd like to help you do it, Rip told him. The sheriff stared at him, said slowly, maybe you can. He stroked his chin, adding, you can best do it by keeping your identity secret for to announce who you really are would mean certain gun trouble, pronto. We don't want any bloodshed if we can help it. So for the time being suppose you just become, let us say, Kid Davis, huh? The cowboy nodded. Suits me. They talked on for a while, formed some tentative plans. Then Rip went out to find his lanky pal. A short time later, as the two Wadis sat together in a Chinese restaurant, Rip's lips twisted in a mysterious smile and he remarked softly, Lou, I feel like partying tonight so I guess I'll take in a fiesta. Where? You guessed it, out at the 4 Cage Ranch. My gosh, are you loco? Should you be recognized out there, yeah, I know, but I'm betting I won't, and I just can't resist the temptation to go to the jamboree. Well, if you're bound to go I'll ride with you, Lou told him after some vain argument, and the old-timer wouldn't budge from that decision. Between 8 and 9 o'clock that night the two cowboys left Dais and hit the trail for the Dakota Ranch, 10 miles away. They rode leisurely, and it was an hour before they came within sight of the place. They drew rein on a barren rise and sat their mounts there for a while, gazing down upon the spread. The main building was a great, sprawling, Spanish-style structure. They could see varicolored Japanese lanterns scattered about the huge patio. Blotches of shadow told them that a great many saddled horses and rigs stood about the ranch house. The night was very still, and strains of music drifted to them, even at this distance. The bunkhouse was lighted, too and halfway between this building and the main one, men could be seen moving about a barbecue pit. When the Dakotas throw a party they do it upright, observed hatchet-faced old Lou Cayley. The two Wadis moved on. As they came onto the ranch premises, they suddenly paused. They were close to a cage-like structure now, 
situated not far from the huge barn. They could hear a fluttering, and a croaking. They rode closer, craned their necks and peered. Pigeons, remarked Rip Campbell. Now we know where those birds we saw today came from. The 4 cage outfit must be mighty fond of squabs and pigeon pot pies, said Lou. There's a goodly flock of them little critters in there. They rode away, and as they did so Lou spoke softly from a corner of his mouth. Hey, Rip. That little shack there about twenty steps from the pigeon house. Somebody has been watching us through a window. See? Rip did see, the blurred shadow of a hatted head, behind the glass. Humphrey. He muttered. It was as if the fellow had been put there to guard the birds. Those pigeons must be a special pets of the Dakotas, partner. But the feathered creatures were soon forgotten. Rip Campbell and his lanky friend had arrived at the patio wall. They rose in their stirrups and looked over its top. The music had stopped. A recess had been called in the open-air dancing, and the guests were chatting, sitting, strolling about. Some were sipping drinks. All right, here I go, Rip said in an undertone, and as lightly as a bobcat he swung himself to the top of the wall. And here I come right behind you, chuckled old Lou Cayley. They dropped down within the patio and stood side by side for a moment listening. Then the ex-ranger said, well, we're in the wolf's den, so we might as well gourd head, as the feller says, and see what the rest of it is like. Rip bobbed his Stetson in a nod. He moved his two guns up and down, loosening them in the holsters, and then he led the way. The so-called patio was nothing more nor less than a large extent of grounds, surrounded by an adobe wall. Ned Dakota's wife, long since passed on, had been a great lover of flowers. Now the vast garden and its growth were carefully tended by the Mexican couple who kept house for the Dakotas, and did the cooking for the whole ranch. Rip Campbell and Lou Cayley moved along a winding walk that was hedged with flowering shrubbery. The scent of the blossoms was sweet in their nostrils. They came to the edge of an opening, and their Rip halted short, pulling Lou to a stop with him. People were strolling all about, but Rip had eyes for only one person, a girl. It was Beth Prather. She was alone, wandering among the flowers. Wait here he told Lou in a low voice. And then he hurried toward the girl, propelled by an excited eagerness, his heart pounding. Again he stopped. Although he was within a few yards of her she had not noticed him as yet. She turned now and looked up at the moon. Its light flooded down into her face, showing it clearly. He saw pensive sadness there. Then her eyes turned toward Mexico, and as she gazed abstractedly her slender fingers slowly picked a rose to pieces. Rip wondered if by chance she was thinking of him of the desperate kid who had fled across the Rio Grande ten years before. He pressed quickly on. She became conscious of his presence now and turned. They looked at each other in silence. She leaned toward him, peering. He gulped. Had she recognized him? Her brow was a little troubled. Her lips parted as if she would speak, but at that instant came interruption in the form of Cal Dakota. Cal took one of the girl's hands, and she smiled up into his face. His cold eyes were fixed on Rip Campbell in a hard stare. What are you doing here, cowboy? And who are you, anyway? Rip showed white teeth in a smile. I'm just a roaming cowboy from Mexico. I thought I could maybe get me a job here. Cal Dakota evinced almost startled interest. Mexico, eh? He spoke softly. And just what led you to believe that you might get a job at the 4-H? Fella on the other side suggested I might. Said the 4-H is the biggest spread in these parts. And who are you, mister? I'm Cal Dakota. Then and you're just the fella I wanted to see. No, you want to see my dad. He's the big boss around here. Come on, I'll take you to him. Excuse me for a while, won't you, Beth? As they moved away Rip glanced at Luke Haley, who stood half hidden within the shadows. The old ex-ranger looked worried, but Rip grinned confidently. You happen to know Miss Prather? Cal asked. I noticed you were talking to her. No, I hadn't even spoke to her. I was just going to ask the young lady where I might find the ranch owner. I guess you heard about the little trouble I had in town today. A fellow made a slighting remark about the girl and I? Yes, I heard all about that. And I want to thank you for what you did. You see, Miss Prather is my girl. He stressed the last words warningly and gave the cowboy a hard look. Rip said innocently, Oh, engaged, huh? Well, practically. I very nearly fired Tezzy for what he said. But... His tone was not that of one deeply concerned. They found Ned Dakota busy with some papers in his office. He wheeled around in his swivel chair as they entered. Rip Campbell went cold and iron hard all through as he gazed once more into the coppery eyes of the man who had slain his uncle, ten years before. The fellow had changed very little except that his hair was frosty around the edges. Dad, said Cal, here's Ranny from Mexico, 
who says he was told over there he might get a job here. He's the quick draw fellow who made Tessie eat crow, and who told Dax Bradwell where to get off. The elder Dakota's leonine face showed quickened interest. Just as his son had done, he said softly. Mexico, huh? Sit down. He raised thick eyebrows inquiringly. You can call me Kid, Kid Davis. Then began much subtle innuendo between Rip Campbell and the Dakotas. The keen-eyed, keen-witted cowboy soon guessed that they were in connivance with some crooked gang in Mexico, and that they thought he might be a messenger from their allies. Their questions indicated as much. Just who was it told you that you might hook up here? Asked Ned. Rip answered as he poured tobacco into a troughed paper. I don't just remember. Somebody over there, though. Cal and Ned exchanged glances. The answer might be calculated to shield a king snake, even from them. Silence for a moment, while they studied him keenly. Then Cal blurted, Haven't I seen you somewhere before? A little shock jarred Rip Campbell, but he allowed none of the excitement to show on his face. His slender fingers were perfectly steady as he twirled the cigarette. Maybe, he answered casually, if you've spent much time in Mexico. I was practically brought up down there. Yeah? Just where? For what outfits have you worked? His gray eyes dared them, and he said with an acid smile, nowhere in particular, and I worked for a number of outfits. Again Cal and his father exchanged glances. The cowboy was cautious, all right. This caution impressed them more than if he had talked freely. Experienced buscaderos were as wary as lobos. The innuendo continued. All was very vague. Rip Campbell saw that the subtlety was beginning to irk the Dakotas. They could not come out and openly ask him the things they wanted to know without exposing their own hands, and they were not sure of him. He was so elusive, so vague. After a while Ned Dakota said, We're mighty careful who we hire on this ranch, cowboy. A rider must have references. He stressed the last word, then peered at the lean face before him. Once more Rip smiled mysteriously. I'm sure you'd find me just the kind of man you want, he spoke softly. Again the two Dakotas exchanged glances, baffled, half-angry looks this time, then they stared at him anew. His heart beat fast. It seemed that they must see something familiar in his face, that they were striving to place him. He felt just about as comfortable as if he had been sitting over the mouth of a snake's den. But outwardly he was cool, wholly unperturbed. Now, although he pretended not to notice, he became aware of a presence just outside a window. Was it his pal, or one of the four cage men? He almost sighed audibly in relief when after a moment Cal Dakota said, you may go out and join the guests if you like, cowboy. Dad and I will have a little talk, and I'll see you later. Rip nodded, got up and walked out. Cal looked at Ned and asked, Well, what do you think? The burly ranchman shook his big, bushy thatched head and growled, Damned if I know what to think. He's an Ely one, that Jasper. If he's one of Lambert's men he certainly knows how to work smoothly. We won't take him on unless we get his brand absolutely right. Keep your eye on him. Might be a good idea to have some of the boys trail him away from here tonight to see where he goes, what he does. Cal Dakota got up. He said flatly, if that fellow is all right we can certainly use him, for he has what it takes. If he isn't all right he's mighty dangerous to us, so, we'll have to get rid of him. Correct, Ned agreed emphatically, then turned back to his desk Cal hitched up his pants and went out. Meanwhile Rip Campbell had found Beth Prather again. The music struck up and he asked her for a dance. She gave him a roving, disinterested glance and murmured consent. She was very cool to him throughout the dance. He felt hurt at first. Had she showed no appreciation for what had happened in town on her account? And then he said to himself, but maybe she doesn't know. She heard me say I was from Mexico, was looking for a job here. Maybe she thinks I'm just another border hopper. If she only knew who I really am. He could not tell her, for two reasons. First, there was no opportunity to speak with her privately. Second, she might be in love with the crook whom he had sworn to land, so he must keep his identity secret from her for the time being. When they had finished the dance, Cal Dakota stepped up to them. There was a look of disapproval on his bold face as he stared at Rip. There's no place for you here right now, he clipped off coldly. Maybe there will be later on. We'll see. Good night. Rip nodded silently again and turned away. Old Lou soon joined him. Just as they were fading into the shadows, the cowboy looked back and saw Beth Prather gazing at him past Cal Dakota's right arm as the couple waltzed. There was a funny, strained expression on her face. Either she knows me, or is doing her dog Gondas to remember where she has ever seen me before, Rip mumbled. I was afraid you was stepping right into a trap when you went into the house, Lou told him. I stationed myself at a window, so as to be ready to help you, should trouble bust loose. 
What were you all talking about? Rip told him, and the leathery old puncher chuckled. As they were leaving they again passed close to the pigeon house, and again they stopped. Once more a human shadow appeared in the nearby shack, in the doorway, this time. He man evidently realized that his presence had been noticed, for now he came boldly forward. He spoke in broken English. The seniors will not disturb the pigeons, please. It is the laying season, and some have young, which do not do well when excite. Pets, huh? Observed Rip. The special pets of the seniors Dakota. And now, buenas noches, vaqueros. So long, they called, and rode away. Lou mumbled while twirling an end of his mustache. Pigeons. Huh. Funny hobby for men like them. But some bad ones are that way. I knew a callous murderer once, who loved all kinds of pets. Rip Campbell said nothing. He had forgotten the pigeons for a moment and was giving his whole attention to something else. Lou, he confided after a while, we're being followed. What's that? The ex-ranger peered behind him. Then he muttered, doggone if we ain't. Maybe they're just trailing us out of suspicion, but I don't care to have them on our tails when we get into the lonely breaks. Well give them the slip. And this they did, by simply wheeling aside in a great, shadowy coulee and hiding amidst some giant rocks. The last they saw of the band, the horsemen were topping a rim, nearly half a mile away. Rip chuckled and said, riding hard, thinking we're doing the same and hoping to bring us into sight again soon. The two cowboys kept away from the trail during the remainder of the ride, for they were afraid they might bump right into the 4-H men on their way back to the home ranch. It was very late when the two waddies arrived on the outskirts of Texton. Nearly the whole town seemed asleep now. Only a scattered few lights were glowing. Rip Campbell led the way up onto Tejas's boot hill. He stopped amidst the little field of crosses, headstones and headboards, got down. Hat in hand he stood in silence gazing upon the grave of his uncle Mort, while mingled sad and bitter memories stormed through his breast. How vividly did he recall when he had stood here like this ten years ago? Then, little Beth Prather had come to him. She had kissed him, and fled sobbing into the dark. Now, it was Beth who needed sympathy and help, although apparently she did not realize the fact. Rip Campbell looked up at his lanky, leathery pal. He said huskily, Partner, there lies a good man. Mortimer Rip, editor and publisher. A fellow who was mighty out of place in this town of crime. He was murdered by Ned Dakota, in cold blood. I swore it here before, I swear it again now, Ned Dakota is going to pay. His voice had been low, deep, just a bit shaky with mingled emotions. Luke Haley felt out of place up there at that moment that his presence was an obtrusion upon the sad privacy of his young friend's thoughts and feelings. He mumbled gently, see you at the hotel, kid, and turned his mount away. Rip stopped him. Take my bronco. Two. I'll walk down into town. Sort of want to be alone for a while out here in the night, and think. Sure, kid, I savvy. Lou picked up his friend's bridle reins and rode away into the gloom. As Rip Campbell stood alone there in the night, ruminating somberly, in the back of his head he formed a plan to have the remains of his uncle exhumed and placed beside those of his parents the first opportunity. As young Rip went slowly down the hill he was still in a dark mood. He passed the place where once had stood his uncle's printing establishment. He stared sadly at the spot where the silvery-haired publisher had lain in death that tragic day. A moment later he came to the corner where he and young Cal Dakota had engaged in the gunfight which had sent Rip away into Mexico, a fugitive. He smiled grimly as he recalled how he had bested the bulldozing young villain, how he had marked the Lobo whelp for life. Chapter 5 The gloomy young cowboy was nearing Dax Bradwell's Crazy Horse Saloon, when he became aware that someone was approaching him that boot soles were scuffing the hard walkway a few yards ahead. He looked up, saw a man staggering along a man who apparently was very drunk. The fellow's legs were wobbly. His head was down, and he was singing in a low, maudlin, untuneful voice. The fellow drew a bandana and began trumpeting his nose. He passed within arm's reach of Rip without giving the cowboy any apparent notice. Rip peered at him, but couldn't see the face, since it was almost completely buried in the bandana. The man reeled by. Rip was about to drop back into his mood of gloomy abstraction, but lurched to a halt and stiffened as he felt the muzzle of a gun ruthlessly prod his back. The man who had played drunk, snarled in a whisper, Don't move, or I'll blow you apart. In swift succession his two guns were plucked from their holsters and flung aside. The gruff voice then ordered, All right, along the alley, and keep your hands down. Somebody might see us. Rip dared now to look over one shoulder. Still he could not see the features of the other man. The fellow had pulled a black neckerchief up over his nose. Say, what is this? 
Rip growled. Shut up. And move, pronto. The other jabbed hard with the six-gun. The experienced young rider of the danger trails had all kinds of respect for a shooting iron, and so without further protest he followed instructions. There was a wide opening between two long store buildings. Down this the cowboy moved, prodded by the hard muzzle of his captor's six-shooter. They arrived at a back corner, and there Rip Campbell again halted short. In the rear of the nearest building three men stood waiting, and their faces too were masked by neck scarves. A small, chilling shock went through Rip. There was ominous portent in the aspect of those three masked men standing there in the gloom, sinister shadows. The one behind him said, Well, here he is, boys. He shoved his prisoner roughly toward the waiting three. A hulking fellow moved a step forward, asked in a muffled voice, Cowboy, do you know what's going to happen to you? Rip said nothing. His lips closed more tightly. Obviously this man's voice, like that of the first one, was disguised, apparently by filling part of the mouth with a neckerchief. The hulking one went on. We don't like you, feller, don't like the way you've started in cutting a wide swath in this town. We're suspicious of you. We'd like to know who you really are, and what you're up to around here. We know you wouldn't come clean without a damned good dressing down, so we aim to beat the living hell out of you for that reason, and just for personal satisfaction. When we're through you'll talk. Rip made a lunge. His right hand streaked for the holster gun at the man's side. But the fellow had been expecting some such move. He let out a low, harsh laugh, sidestepped nimbly, swung a big fist. Rip got away from it. And now all four of the masked men rushed him. Rip Campbell dared not break away and run, for the attackers were snarling threats to shoot him if he did so to gun slug him if he yelled for help. The cowboy kicked backward, heard a gasp of pain as the sharp boot heel sank into a groin. He struck out with his left fist, felt lips grind against teeth. The fight became a wild, fast mix-up. Rip told himself grimly that he was in for a beating that he could scarcely hope to win out against such terrific odds. But he was determined to deal them all the punishment he could before they knocked him cold. He ducked a blow. One fell upon his back and sent him lunging against the hulking man. They clenched. Campbell kicked out his right foot, brought it back. The sharp rowl of his spur drove into the hard flesh of his immediate antagonist, then ripped upward. The fellow groaned in agony and dropped his arms. Again Rip reached for the holstered six-shooter. A fist clubbed him on the side of the neck, paralyzing the muscles for an instant. He was hurled aside, and he brought up with a loud thud against the rear wall of the store building. Another attacker swung at him now. He wagged his head and felt bony knuckles slide past his right cheek. The man let out a loud ouch. As his fist banged against planking, Rip seized the man, and began struggling for the holstered gun, keeping his opponent between himself and the other men the while. He managed to pull the weapon free of leather began trying to force its muzzle against his antagonist's body. Then the fellow whirled him. An arm bent around his neck in a strangle hold, tore him away without the pistol. He sank an elbow to the pit of a stomach and got free. A gun barrel struck him a glancing blow on the head, staggering him. Before he could regain his balance, it seemed that a thunderbolt landed on his chin. He saw a shower of sparks, felt his seat bump hard against the ground. The men swarmed upon him, kicking, stomping, cursing. In their fury and excitement they had forgotten caution. Rip fought like a wounded tiger, kicking, spurring, trying to get up, shouting cuss words. He, too, had ceased to think of fighting quietly. Agony racked his wiry frame. Stabs of pain were darting all through him. It seemed that his ribs were being caved in, his insides stomped out. He gasped for breath. A red mist swam before his eyes. Interruption came. There was a pounding of boots. Blurredly, Rip saw a tall, Shadowy form approaching at a run, along behind the row of buildings. Old Luke Haley's voice bawled raucously, Tuck your tails and run, you coyotes. Pile off of my sidekick? Then his six-shooter began to pop. There was consternation among the masked gang, yapping, cursing, a scurrying of feet. Then a boot crashed to Rip's chin and his consciousness went out in a fiery explosion. When Rip Campbell came to, the lanky ex-ranger was beside him. Rip sat up, shook the cobwebs from his brain worked his jaw, then tenderly felt his face and his body. Where'd they go? He grunted. Ski daddled along the alley, then away into the open spaces. I heard the clattering of their horses' hoofs. Tell me what happened. Briefly Rip did so. Lou growled, stinking polecats. I heard the ruckus on the way back from the stable. Recognized your voice, so come a-running. Since I didn't know exactly what was going on or who was who I didn't shoot to hit anybody. There was a thin run of excitement along Main Street for the sounds of battle had been heard. Rip growled, 
I hate to go out there and answer questions, but I must have my cutters. Deed think you'd want to talk to them to find out who were the coyotes. It was that bunch of shadows from the four cage, I bet my last dollar. I recognized the voice of the hulking Tezzy, in spite of the fact she tried to muffle it. Humphrey. Then the Dakotas sicked them onto you. Do you suppose the ranchers recognized you out there at the four cage tonight? I don't think so. They looked puzzled, inclined to believe I was one of their kind. I figured they were sent to shadow us, merely in the hope of finding out something about us, and that Tezzy exceeded his authority. I think that the beating up was his own idea, to get revenge on me. They went out onto the street and Rip recovered his six shooters. Surely enough he was showered with questions. He simply told that he had been set upon by an unknown band of rowdies. Later he told Lou, better to let Tessie believe they got away with it. But I'll have a reckoning with that Jasper one of these days. Right now I'm playing a game. They went to their hotel room. Rip bathed his cuts and bruises. When finally he and his friend turned in the young gunman said grimly, Sleep well, old timer. We've got some writing to do tomorrow. Once more Rip Campbell stood with hat in hand. This time he was looking at the graves of his parents, out amidst the peaceful hills on the one-time Rip homestead. And there lie two more good people, he told Lou. Dad was killed supposedly by a horse thief, but I've always had a hunch that the slayer was either Ned Dakota or one of his gunnies who'd set a trap for my father. Dakota feared and hated my dad, because he had openly pointed the finger of suspicion at him, and had threatened to organize a vigilante committee to clean up the range, they'd nearly gun fought, too or three. Times. Mother'd been in bad health for quite. A while, and the shock was too much for her. She soon followed him. I was just a five-year-old doggie then. Uncle Mort took me and raised me until I was nearly fourteen, then, well, you know what? Happened. Old Luke Haley answered soberly, sympathetically. Rip Campbell, I understand now more plain than. Ever. Before, how you feel toward the Dakotas. Boy, they've caused you plenty of suffering. Rip looked up at him and smiled, but. It was. Such a smile as to make one's blood creep. He went to his mount and stirruped up. Now where? Asked Lou, anxious to get his young friend's mind onto a new trail of thought. To the Prether Ranch. I want to talk. With Beth. Lou gave him a keen wandering. Glance, but offered no comment. Unbeknown to the two men, Beth Prather, while hunting for a stray horse, had seen them from afar recognizing them as the two riders from below the border, and curious as to their present purpose, she had shadowed them. From concealment she had watched through a pair of binoculars, while the two had paid their visit to the graves. Her pretty face had held a look of wonder as she had seen the young cowboy standing bareheaded, gazing down upon the two mounds. And then an expression of understanding had swept the puzzled look away. She had gasped and almost dropped the glasses. For a long time she sat like a marble image. Then she sprang to her feet, ran to her pony, mounted and rode wildly. She had been at the home ranch about twenty minutes. When the two cowboys arrived there, they stopped on the pretext of asking for water. She invited them into the house. All alone here? Asked Tripp, as he glanced about the neat parlor. At the moment, yes. Mother went into town with a neighbor woman, and the punchers are out on the range. Be seated, won't you? I'll go to the windmill for some fresh water. I'll go with you, Rip volunteered quickly. She offered no. Encouragement no objection, just glanced at him in a disinterested way, then turned toward the kitchen. Right nice little spread you've got here, Rip observed, as side by side they walked to the windmill. My part and I would like to work for you. How about it? Rip had concluded that there was practically no chance of his being employed by the Dakotas. They would have to know him for a renegade before they would put him on the payroll. From this adjacent ranch he would be able to keep an eye on their activities and at the same time look out for Beth's welfare. But the girl said coolly, this ranch employs but two writers regularly, and we have two trustworthy top hands already. He urged, but it was no use. The bucket was full of fresh, cool water now, but he did not drink. Instead he turned suddenly to her and blurted impulsively, Beth, don't you know me? He saw her slender form stiffen. The smooth face became like one carved from marble. Her eyes were very large and dark against, the paleness of it, as she gazed at him. But. She did not answer. I'm Rip. Rip Campbell. He told her in the same husky tone. She nodded. I know, she said simply, but still there was no warmth in her voice. Why did you assume the name of Kid Davis? To keep from having gun trouble with the Dakotas. They'd be after me pronto if they knew who I really am. I'll keep your secret, she promised emotionlessly, then she turned toward the house. And why did you come back? She asked, as he caught up with her. 
Her aloofness had wounded him deeply. She seemed unaffected by the knowledge that he was Rip Campbell, the friend of her childhood that he had come back. Mingled anger, bitterness, and something else which he did not understand at the moment swirled within his heart. He felt a sense of dreariness, and yet at the same moment he wanted to grit his teeth and cuss. He decided that perhaps she had never forgiven him for his apparent coldness toward her, the seeming lack of appreciation for her sympathy that night at the graveside ten years ago. He apologized now, explained. She passed it off casually, as if it were of no consequence. Then he went into a shell, a very hard shell. I guess she's in love with Cal Dakota, or someone else, he told Lou hopelessly as they rode away from the little ranch. So I just told her I was tired of Mexico and wanted to settle down somewhere on this side. Gave her no inkling of the real story. On a hilltop they paused. Dawn in a valley, showing mingled white and red in the bright sunlight, were the buildings of the Dakota Ranch. Rip Campbell absently drew his glasses and focused them. There go the pigeons again, heading for Mexico, he told Lou. Two men down by that big cage, and one of them looks like Cal Hammer. He was frowning in deep thought as they moved on. After a while he remarked slowly, I wonder if there's some mystery in connection with those birds? Yeah, I've been wondering the same thing. We'll keep the thought in mind, partner, and maybe give them pigeon some investigating. They traveled on and after a while saw three horsemen moving across country from the direction of the Rio Grande. Riders from below the line, muttered Lou, squinting his coffee brown eyes shrewdly, and it looks like they're heading for the four cage. A lope up there to the hill crest and watch them. From that rim I can see all the way down to the Dakota Ranch. I'll wait for you at the spring over yonder by that model of Cottonwoods. I want to unsaddle, adjust my latigo, and rearrange my saddle blanket. They parted company, Lou making for the hill rim. Rip Campbell heading toward the cottonwoods. As the cowboy pushed through some brush and came out beside the spring, he jerked his mount to a stop and his right hand involuntarily dropped to the butt of a six-gun. A man was there ahead of him, a very unusual sort of man, for that wilderness scene. The stranger was rather large, and there was about him a certain air of pompousness. He wore a soft black hat, a flowing black tie, a black store-bought suit, the coat long. His vest was cream-colored, with little black checks. A gold cable watch chain swung from pocket to pocket. His face was round and soft, his hair frosty. At sight of the wiry young rider sitting his mount, hand on six gun the man shot a glance toward some white feathers that were scattered near the spring. Then he looked at a half-gallon can which was steaming on a bed of coals. The stranger was sitting hugging his knees, a will a fork in one hand. A short distance away were two horses, one obviously a pack animal. The open pack was spread out beneath a big cottonwood tree. Rip Campbell glanced at the feathers, too, then his cold eyes flicked back to the stranger. Pigeons, huh? The cowboy observed and there was curiosity in his voice. Yes, they were watering here, and being short of provisions I just couldn't resist the temptation to knock over a couple of them. If they belong to your spread I'm willing to pay for them. Rip wagged his head. They weren't pets of mine. I don't work around here at all. Just a drifter looking for a job. The other grinned in vast relief. Then get right down cowboy, and join me in some pigeon stew. These birds have been simmering for the last hour. They ought to be getting just about right. He chuckled. I sure thought I was in for it when I saw you sitting your mount there, hand on hardware. Just a habit, remarked Rip, as he swung down and dropped his reins. Then to himself he muttered, pigeons. Um em. I wonder if there's any significance. My name is Alberts, Hugh J. Alberts. People usually call me Judge Alberts. The big, a vicious looking man had got up and was offering a soft hand. Rip shook, but did not mention his own name, or an alias. The judge served the pigeon stew, crackers, and coffee. The two men conversed as they sipped. Although Alberts talked volubly, Rip observed that he nevertheless was vague. He had come from somewhere down in the lower Rio Grande country, and was on his way northward to enter into some sort of business. He did not state whether or not he was a real judge, but he certainly looked the part. The fellow had an amiable, likable personality. Rip wondered what he was doing horsebacking it through that rough country. People of such apparent distinction usually travel by stage or train. When the meal was finished and the pack closed, Judge Alberts suggested that they ride to Tejas together. Rip mentioned that he was to wait there for a friend. The judge smiled blandly and said, then I'll wait, too, and we'll all travel together. In the meantime, just to kill time, what do you say to a little game of draw poker, for matches, or gravels? I believe I have a deck of cards in one of my saddle pockets. Rip agreed, the judge brought the deck and they began to play. Rip was very lucky. After a while the judge suggested that they play for money, small money, 
just to make it more interesting. Again Rip acquiesced. And before he realized it he had been inveigled into a big money game and was being taken to an artistic cleaning. Too late he realized that this bland, amiable fellow who had called himself Judge Alberts, was in reality a mountebank a card shark. He was mentally kicking himself for having been a sucker, when suddenly old Lou Cayley wrote into the opening. No, you don't, you swindler. Yelped Lou, as the judge reached to rake in a new pot. Alberts glanced up in startled surprise, then a glad light overspread his round face and he scrambled to his feet. Lou Cayley, by hell. What are you doing here, you long-legged jackass? And how are you, anyway? Lou swung down. The mouth between the two horns of mustache was stretched in a grin. Same back at you, judge, you danged old rascal. They pumped arms, and then Hugh J. Albert smiled and explained pompously, I'm on my way to Tejas to enter the field of politics. Meaning gambling, chuckled Lou. Devil help the galoots who stack up again you. Then he turned to Rip and said while grinning from ear to ear, I reckon he took you to a nifty cleaning, huh, cowboy? Rip Campbell nodded sheepishly, and old Lou burst into a guffaw. Alberts hastened to say, don't think for a minute that I'd cheat a friend of yours, Lou. Here's your money back, cowboy. I meant to return it anyway. I slicked you only as a lark. I. Like hell, chortled Lou. Hugh J. Alberts glared at him indignantly for a moment, and then the political-looking man, too, burst into a laugh. Rip joined them. Lou Cayley remarked, likely you'll be locating in the crazy horse, as that's Dehus's principal saloon and gambling house. While dealing your pasteboards there, you might be able to do some good, if you will. How? By acting as our eyes and ears, savvy? Rip gave his partner a warning look, but Lou told him confidently, you don't need to worry none about the judge, partner. He helped me a lot when I was in the ranger service. Then he went on to give Alberts an idea of the situation there in that country. The frosty-haired gambler promised soberly to help them if he could. Then you'd better go on down the trail ahead of us, suggested Lou. It will be better if you don't know us, never met up with us. Savvy? Judge Hugh J. Alberts agreed that his old friend was right, and so a few minutes later he headed down the trail alone, riding one horse and leading another. A strange character, remarked Rip, as he watched the big, officious-looking man depart. He sure is, agreed Lou. A deceiving old rogue who'd cheat a fellow out of his last dollar, and yet who'd give a needy person his last dime. Seems to be a gentle, likable soul, in spite of his profession. Lou spat tobacco juice at a grasshopper, chuckled again. Yeah, seems to be, and he is unless his corns are tromped on. But, cowboy, Judge Hugh J. Alberts is a fighting fool once his dander is up. He carries a colt under that long black coat, a derringer up once leave, and a throwing knife down the back of his collar. And believe me the Jasper is expert with all three. Rip changed the subject. How about those riders? Did they go to the 4 cage? He asked. Sure did. Maybe they were some of that spread's crew. On the other hand, might be they were wolves from below the border. They loafed at the spring, for they wanted to give Alberts about an hour's start of them, to allow him time to reach town before they again rode. They were just about ready to mount, when Rip heard the ex-ranger say, Arr, here comes Cal Dakota. Rip had been tightening his cinch. He glanced up and, looking through the stand of columns that were trunks of giant cottonwoods, caught glimpses of an approaching horseman. It was Cal Dakota all right. The man was riding leisurely, apparently with no thought of finding anyone at the spring. As Dakota rounded the mod of Cottonwoods, however, he immediately saw the two men, and as he came on his attitude bespoke deep curiosity. He rode up and halted. H. His cold blue eyes bored each man swiftly as he said, Howdy, gents. Didn't expect to find anybody here. Just dropped by to water my bronc. Same here, spoke Rip. Dakota swept the whole place with a glance, then, and Rip was sure that the fellow started slightly as his eyes riveted upon the scattering of feathers beside the spring. When those eyes stared again at him and Lou, they were as hard as marbles. The fellow blurted almost angry, Pigeons, huh? Rip nodded. Looks like somebody had a pigeon stew. Yeah, somebody, Cal Dakota said dryly, still drilling them with a suspicious gaze. Rip Campbell shrugged. Don't look that way at us, we're not guilty. You can easy see we're not carrying cooking utensils. Cal looked around again. Yeah, that's right. Think a powerful lot of your pigeons, don't you, Mr. Dakota? Your Mexican watchman hopped us the other night for just stopping to look at them. Cal Dakota was silent for a moment, his bold face inscrutable, and then he said slowly, they're pets, a hobby of mine. You any idea who did this? He gestured toward the feathers. Again Rip shrugged. Why should I? 
I'm a stranger in these parts. Some peon traveler, maybe. The glare of suspicion remained in Dakota's cold blue eyes. How happens that you two rannies are out this way? Apparently it was just a casual inquiry, a change of subject, but Rip knew that the fellow was as alert as a wolf. The cowboy answered lightly. We were on our way to the forecage, to find out if your father had made up his mind yet about giving us a job. Again there was some subtle innuendo, but Rip Campbell was just as elusive as before. He could see that Cal Dakota was baffled, irritated, and he chuckled inwardly. The 4 cage has no job open at the present, Dakota said curtly. Maybe we can use you later, provided you can give absolute proof that you're all right. Ranchmen have to be mighty careful around here these days. A lot of border hoppers in the country. He gave Rip a searching stare, then abruptly he wheeled his mount, spoke a durst so long, and went loping away. Forgot to water his bronco, observed old Lou Cayley, as he squinted one eye, and toyed with his long mustache. A funny little smile was playing about Rip's lips. Yeah, the fellow was right upset. We've got him and his dad buffaloed, partner. They don't know what to think about us. And, pigeons. Some mystery there, like, sure as you're a foot high. See how startled he looked when he saw the feathers? Pets, huh? The only thing Cal Dakota would pet is a six-gun or a rifle. Lou bobbed his head, fingered his bony chin. Yeah, we'll investigate the birds, he declared. And something tells me we'll be taking a big risk in so doing. Chapter 6 At the Crazy Horse Saloon, the judge was into a game of draw poker in the same amiable, seemingly innocent manner with which he had inveigled Rip Campbell. And just as Rip had done, Bradwell awoke too late to the realization that he was up against a card sharp. Recognizing the man as a genius in his profession, Bradwell had been only too glad to give the smiling, apologetic, official-looking gentleman a house job there in the crazy horse. Thus it was that when Rip and Luke Haley arrived in Tejas, they found the likable old mountebank already ensconced in a position of prominence at the town's leading house of recreation. Early that night Luke Haley got himself bogged down into a poker game with four other waddies. Rip roamed about town. He talked with the sheriff, his old friend Aldous Sullivan, and others. It was about nine o'clock when he stopped abruptly on the street and stared. A muttered exclamation escaped his lips. A light was burning in the hotel room which he and Lou had rented. Humphrey. I wonder what that means? He asked himself. Just the hotel man attending to something? Or is somebody bent on stealing our chaps and war bags? He went hurrying along the sidewalk, boot heels rapping sharply upon the planking. He found the skinny old clerk alone in the lobby, reading an El Paso newspaper. Who's upstairs? The cowboy snapped. Underscore. The frowsy-haired old fellow looked at him over silver-rimmed spectacles and replied, Why, nobody at this early hour of the night. What few guests we got are out enjoying themselves, and they won't start coming in until. He broke off and gazed in surprise, for Rip had walked swiftly across the small lobby and now was running lightly up the stairs. The hallway was very dark. Treading as softly as a prowling cat, Campbell went to his room. There was no streak of light at the bottom of the door. He stooped and applied an eye to the keyhole. Still no light. Crouched there he listened intently. Not a sound. Had the prowler accomplished his purpose and sneaked away, or was he waiting in there within the room, gun in hand? Rip's thin lips hardened over his teeth. He drew one of his colts. The other hand went out aid found the doorknob. A turn, a little push, and he knew that the door was unlocked. The next instant he flung it wide open and started to leap into the room but instead of so doing he spat an exclamation and whirled on the balls of his feet. A human bulk collided with him and carried him backward. A hand that gripped like a bear trap had seized his right wrist and shoved it aside. A fist smashed against his jaw, and he saw a shower of small stars. The next instant he was down, on his back. Dazed though he was, his left hand dropped instinctively to the other. That hand was swept away. He felt the gun rip from leather, heard it thud against a wall several feet away. Rallying his wits, he started to fight. But a gun barrel cracked against his head and consciousness fled from him. He became conscious of a soft buzzing. It resolved itself into guarded voices. One of them said, not a thing to give us a line on him. Another muttered, footsteps on the stairs. Come on, let's scoot. There was a soft rushing of feet. Rip sat up and shook his head. His brain was swimming dizzily. Still goofy from the blow above the left ear, he got to his feet and staggered crazily about in the dark. Then as his senses began to clear he reeled to the door and stepped out into the hall. The wizened old clerk, carrying a lighted lamp, was just coming into view on the small landing. The little man held the light high, thrust forward his skinny neck and stared bug-eyed. What the deuce happened? 
He wanted to know. I got to wondering about how funny you'd acted, so I decided to investigate. You look as though you'd been mugwumped. Couple of fellas were pilfering my room. They slugged me. Did you see anybody leave? No, but there's a rear stairs. Maybe. Rip's brain was pretty clear now. He wheeled, sprang back into the room, struck a match and located his two guns. The next moment he was pounding down the hallway, a Colt 45 in each fist. The back door was standing wide open. He ran out onto the little balcony and glanced about. Not a living thing within sight. Down the steps he went, boots thumping. He circled the rear end of the hotel building, sped through a dark little alley, and came onto the edge of the street. He flung glances right and left, but Main Street looked innocent enough. There were only a few human figures moving in the semi-gloom, and none of them was close. Head perfectly clear now, although still aching, he considered the situation swiftly. The voices had come to him in muffled tones, while he was still in a daze. But unless he was mistaken they belonged to Cal and Ned Dakota, and so he set out grimly to find the two ranchmen. He was striding past an opening between two dark store buildings, when he heard a scuffing of boots upon gravel. Instantly he was pivoting, jerking into a crouch, fanning for guns. He jabbed the two colts away, muttered an exclamation, sprang forward as his old pal staggered into the dim light. Blood was running down one leathery cheek. Lou, Rip blurted huskily. What the dickens happened? I'd set out to look for you and was passing the mouth of this black alley when somebody struck me from behind. Don't understand it at all, he mumbled as he dug a wallet from a pocket and opened it. I ain't been robbed. But you were thoroughly searched, same as me. Look, shirt unbuttoned, couple pockets turned inside out. But who? Why? The Dakotas thought maybe they'd find something, on us which would show them what we are, renegades, or lawmen. They're up a tree about us. They hoped to find badges, or other credentials, either from the law or their friends in Mexico, and thereby satisfy their minds. He then swiftly told of his own experience. Come on, he snapped, let's see if we can find those two. Lou wiped the blood from his cheek and accompanied his young friend. They searched, and made inquiries throughout the town, but they did not see or hear anything of the Dakotas. I guess the stinkers sneaked in, hid their mounts in the dark, and sneaked away again when their dirty work was done, growled Rip. Let's have the doc look at the bruises on our heads. Then we'll go over to the hotel room and take a look around. As they tramped on Lou suggested, maybe it wasn't the Hammers who conked us maybe it was Tezzy and that same gang. It was the Dakotas, I tell you. I recognized their voices, even though I was only semi-conscious. The bird-faced old clerk was inquisitive when they entered the hotel a short time later, but they soon dismissed him curtly. Alone with Lou in their room reprison, the Dakotas must have heard my inquiry at the desk or my footsteps on the stairs. One of them was hiding here, the other in the room opposite. Did you notice its door is open? Hey, look at this! Lou exclaimed suddenly. He picked up a feather from the floor, handed it to his young friend. Evidently the fellow who dropped it has been among the birds lately. It clung to his duds, or maybe fell into a pocket, and during the tussle here it fell to the floor unnoticed. Lou twisted his long mustache and mumbled, Yeah, partner, we sure got to do some more looking into that pigeon business. If we could only manage to get hired out at the four cage. The Dakotas won't employ anybody that they're unsure of. We'll locate close enough to keep an eye on that ranch, though, at the Prather spread. Huh? But I thought you said the gal refused to hire us, that she has a couple of punchers already, and don't want no more. Rip smiled mysteriously. They're quitting their jobs. The hawk face told Cowpoke blinked. You don't mean, you're going to use gun persuasion to make them drift? Wait and see, Rip replied then laughed recklessly. From a distance Rip and Lou Cayley saw the two punchers quit the ranch. Rip grinned broadly and said, well, there they go. Lou nodded. How'd you do it, partner? Let me in on your secret. I felt I could. Confide in them. They were Nestor kids when I left these parts. Their dad and mine had been great friends. It wasn't hard for me to persuade them to take a vacation, with pay. I furnished the pay. And now I reckon you figured the girl will hire us in their stead. If she doesn't we'll camp on this ranch anyway. They found Beth at the horse corral. Good morning, gents, she greeted as she eyed them curiously from under a side of her hat brim. Stop off for water again? No, answered Rip. We're on our way to the 4 cage to see once more about getting on there. Met up with those two punchers who are leaving you, and figured you might hire us in their places. We figured we'd rather work for you than for the Dakotas. I'm surprised you'd work for the Dakotas at all. Just what is the idea, Rip? We've got to work somewhere, and the Dakotas haven't recognized me. She eyed him keenly. By the way, 
You didn't by any chance have anything to do with shorties and lasses quitting this ranch, did you? You mean me and Lou? Shucks, how could we? She looked down at her boot dose to keep the two punchers from seeing the twinkle in her eyes. All right, you're hired. Take the first day sort of getting acquainted with the ranch. As she walked toward the house she was laughing secretly. They had guilt written all over their faces, she told herself. I'll have to give them credit for being ingenious. And so Rip Campbell and Lou Cayley went to work for the Prathers. The Dakotas quickly learned of the fact, for Cal was a frequent visitor there. He told Beth, they're doubtful characters. Keep an eye on them, and tell me if you notice anything off-color. Perhaps he had decided that it was just as well that they were there, where his girl could watch them for him. Rip and Beth often rode range together in the days that followed. He felt that he was irresistibly falling in love with her. She had not altered her aloof, business-like manner toward him, however, and he told himself bitterly that she must be in love with Cal Dakota. One day came a report from Judge Hugh J. Alberts. Something's up. The Dakotas and Dax Bradwell have been plotting. Once I heard Cal say something about pigeons. He spoke rather loud, and instantly his dad and Bradwell shushed him down. They had met the judge in a restaurant. Now they went to see the sheriff. The lawman suggested, maybe the pigeons are used to carry notes. But why a whole flock of them? Asked Tripp. Um em, yeah, that's right, unless the others are sent along just to confuse anybody who might become suspicious. Old Lou Cayley squinted one mild brown eye and said thoughtfully, In my ranger days I learned that smugglers sometimes use mighty ingenious schemes to get their stuff across the border. Maybe the birds are bringing over contraband, say, dope, or jewels. Rip smiled twistedly and wagged his head. Wild idea, old timer. A pigeon couldn't carry enough dope to make smuggling pay. And diamonds? Huh. What smuggler would trust anything so precious on a bird? Not on him, maybe, but in him, the craw or the innards. And, no, a single pigeon couldn't carry enough dope to make smuggling pay, but a big flock of them making frequent trips could. A little tube fixed to each end. He shrugged bony shoulders, gestured with long arms. Rip was staring. He exclaimed hoarsely, Gosh, I hadn't thought of such possibilities. The sheriff whacked muscular legs with heavy hands. Old timer, you may have something there. Meet me at the spring early in the morning, you two. I'll bring three shotguns and we'll go bird hunting. Meaning? Rip questioned. We'll stake out in the brakes and bring down some of them feathered critters, then we'll examine them inside and out. The partners had figured that the pigeons made daily flights hack and forth, and that they always followed approximately the same course. The three men stationed themselves on a hogback, some fifty yards from each other, and waited. Three days in succession they did this, and on each occasion they brought down pigeons, both coming and going. They fine combed the birds, literally turned them inside out, but found nothing to substantiate their suspicions. By mid-morning of the third day, they had shot down three pigeons from a flock bound for Mexico, and had just finished literally taking them apart. It seems a shame to have killed the little fellows, said Rip Campbell but there's so much at stake. Well, we won't shoot any more of them, sighed the sheriff. Guess we'll have to admit we're licked, this time. I still say there's some mystery about the pigeons, Rip declared stubbornly. That flock, or another one, is due back at the 4 cage sometime this afternoon. I suggest we watch the ranch, and be on hand when they come in. Good idea, agreed John Nelson. And we'll examine every bird from bill to claws. They had taken the slain birds down into the valley to examine them. The little rocky opening wherein they sat was closely surrounded by thick brush. Now as Rip's gaze came up from the gutted pigeon he held in his hands, he stiffened and an electric shock went through him. His eyes had squarely met those of someone who was peering through the foliage, ten paces away. Instantly foliage and slender branches flurried, blotting out the handmade drift. The eyes were gone. Rip sprang to his feet. Somebody's been watching and eavesdropping, he exclaimed, and went bounding toward the spot where the spy had stood. Muttering in excitement, Lou and the sheriff got up and ran after him. Rip plunged into the bushes and glanced about. His guns were in his hands, for the eavesdropper might fight if he found himself cornered. Rip glimpsed no one, however, for he could see but a short distance in any direction. He paused to listen, but by this time his two friends were smashing into the brush, and he could hear no other sound. He yapped as they joined him. You go left, sheriff. Straight ahead, Lou. I'll turn right. We'll round up the fella and make him talk. He put down his head and went charging away, tearing through the bushes like a chased maverick. Now and then he paused to listen, but he could hear only the sounds created by his two comrades. They were calling back and forth too. Each other occasionally as they smashed through the brush. 
After a while he came out into a scattered forest of mesquite and scrub cedar. Breathing heavily he stopped once more. No longer could he hear the sounds of his two friends' movements. He was some two hundred yards from the spot where the search had been started. He was about to head back, and then he jerked to a halt. A rider had come out of the scrub forest and was flitting over the crest of a barren rise. The next instant the rider had vanished. Rip Campbell's blood was cold and sluggish in his veins, for he had recognized the fleeing one as Beth Prather. For a full minute after she had disappeared he continued to stand there and stare. Then he turned slowly and headed back for the horses. He was like a person in a daze. His heart was leaden, a bit sick. His boots seemed ponderous and clumsy. His brain was spinning dizzily. He shook his head, ran a hand over his face as if to wake himself from an incredible dream. Beth. He whispered hoarsely. How come she was watching and eavesdropping? Was she acting as a spy for the Dakotas? The thought galled and angered him. Back at the spot where he had seen her peering through the foliage, he found tracks made by her little boots. For a long time he stood there gazing at them, his face like stone, his gray eyes as cold as ice. Then slowly, with rakes of one of his own boots, he erased the dim prints. Afterward, like a man in a dream, he went into the little rocky opening and sat down to wait the return of his two comrades. He muttered, and to think, she'd throw in with the Dakotas, against me, especially when I'm trying to help her. Beth Prather, what a change the years have wrought in you. Lou and the sheriff soon found him there. No sound, no sign, the square-jawed officer announced laconically. You? Rip forced a smile. I heard plenty of sounds, made by you too. We might look around for horse tracks, suggested Lou. What for? growled the sheriff. It's a cinch that spy was from the 4K ranch, I reckon our banging away with the shotguns attracted attention. Maybe this spy business explains why we ain't found nothing on or in the birds, suggested Lou. Maybe the Dakotas have known all along what we were up to. Maybe, Sheriff John Nelson admitted. But just the same, we'll be on hand when the pigeons arrive at the 4K ranch this afternoon. Chapter 7 From concealment the three men watched the 4K ranch house in the western sky. The day was beginning to wear away. The sun was only an hour high now. Maybe there won't be. Any birds from Mexico today, muttered old Lou Cayley, disappointment in his voice. Rip Campbell bit out, in that case. He broke off in an exclamation. He had been stretched out on the ground, but now he jerked to a sitting position. Look, he said tensely. Three riders were leisurely approaching the ranch. The Dakotas, and Beth Prather, Lou whispered wonderingly. What's she doing there? The sheriff suggested something which brought rage boiling up within Rip Campbell. The girl might have lost a few rangeland compunctions while away in that shorthorn school. And with the Prathers sort of hard up financially, I wonder if she is thrown in with the Dakotas and, shut up! Snarled Rip, and he glared like a prodded tiger. You finish what you started to suggest and I'll slam the words right back down your throat. Here, here. Climb off your high horse, cowboy. I tilda. The pigeons. Lou interrupted. The sheriff scrambled up and made hurriedly for his mount. Come on, we want to be on hand when the birds arrive. They approached the ranch at a brisk gallop even so, the fast-flying flock beat them there. It circled two or three times, flocks of white against the soft blue of the sky, then settled onto the cage houses. The Mexican came out of the nearby shack, and shut the pigeons away. His gaze was upon the three approaching riders as he did so. They pulled up close to the wire netting. Right nice flock of birds you got there. Remarked the sheriff. Could I buy a dozen of them? Kien Sabe, the swarthy keeper murmured. He was a sullen, low browed, bushy headed fellow who walked with a limp. Mind if I go in and look at them? The three riders dismounted. The Mexican glanced uneasily toward the house, then relief flooded his pockmarked face. Here has come the Dakotas. It is for them to grant the permission, senores. Rip looked past an angle of the little building, hardened at sight of Beth Prather coming along with the Dakotas. Howdy. Gents, greeted Cal as the trio came up. What brings you out this way today, Sheriff? Been hunting for the sign of a horse thief who was reported seen in the breaks. Run into these two waddies on the edge of Shamrock Range, and they volunteered to help me. No luck, though. You folks see a stranger about lately? The Dakotas shook their heads. The lawman then asked Cal the same question that he had put to the Mexican. Why, sure, you can have a dozen of them, Cal generously offered come in and look them over. The investigators were taken aback. They had expected Cal to demur. But he led the way into the cage, began catching birds and handing them over for inspection. Rip sensed that the fellow was mocking the searchers that there really was something wrong here, and that young Dakota was sardonically defying them to find it. 
vaguely in Rip's mind those birds had taken on a sinister meaning. But when the whole flock had been searched, not a thing of a suspicious nature had been found. Cal Dakota said generously, pick out any twelve you want, Sheriff, and... I'll pick them up some other time, Nelson interrupted. Got to make preparations for them, you know, build a home. Rip had observed that the pigeon coat was divided into two parts, that the birds on the other side all were colored. He mentioned this, and Cal Dakota explained, they're what we call the impure. No matter how careful you are in breeding, colored ones just will show up occasionally. We separate the colored birds from the whites and eat the off-breeds as squabs, or in pigeon stews and pies. The explanation was perfectly logical, yet Rip's feelings that there was something sinister in connection with the pigeons persisted. He imagined there were malevolent, gloating notes in their croaking. The investigators did not ask to examine the colored birds, for it was only white ones which they had seen in flight. The sheriff inquired about these flights, but Cal explained that it was only for the purpose of exercise. All the time, though, the sardonic light remained in his cold eyes, the ghost of a sneering smile on his lips. Beth Prather's expression was puzzling. Was it faint amusement, calm defiance, or what? She invited the sheriff to have supper at the Cloverleaf 3. It's but a little out of your way, and Mother will have everything ready by the time we get there. John Nelson readily agreed. As the Dakotas watched the party leave, Cal's face creased in a mocking smile. Foxy, he murmured softly. But not foxy enough. They didn't find anything wrong with the birds. They never will. We're too smart for them. And it seemed that inside the cages the restless birds increased their ghoulish croaking. Cal laughed harshly. Ned suggested in a throaty growl, John Nelson ain't through yet. He'll be snooping around here again. You can bet on that. Let him hop to it. In fact, he can come out here and act as keeper of the damned things if he likes, just so long as we're allowed to do the turning out of them, and to see them when they come in, eh, Dad? Old Ned Dakota bobbed his head, and they both laughed harshly. Supper at the Shamrock Ranch had been over an hour ago. The sheriff had hit the trail for Texton. Rip Campbell and Lou Cayley were alone in the little bunkhouse. Lou might just as well have considered that he himself was alone, for Rip hadn't said a word since they had come down from the main house. He had just been sitting there hunched on an edge of his bunk, staring grimly at the floor, smoking cigarette after cigarette. Finally the old ex-ranger said bluntly, Well, for gosh sakes come on and get it off your chest, cowboy. What's eating you? Rip was not going to tell him that it was Beth Prather who had spied upon them that day. No one was aware that he knew the identity of the eavesdropper, not even Beth, he thought. The cowboy ground a cigarette butt under a boot sole and said in a hard, deliberate voice. Lou, I've been thinking. I'm still convinced there's some crooked business in connection with those pigeons. Why would they be so carefully tended, so closely guarded? Calhammer was laughing up his sleeve out there today. He knew we'd come to try to get something on him and his killer dad, and he was daring us to find anything wrong. Yeah, I got the same impression. There were mocking devils in his eyes as he helped us to examine them birds. We're going back tonight, now. Yeah? How come? Rip Campbell explained in a low, staccato voice. Lou's brown eyes glowed. He slapped his thin, bowed legs and exclaimed, by gollies the scheme might work. Come on, let's get going. Rip grinned now. Yes, and guns might work there at the fork cage, too. Better not feel so jubilant until we're safely back here at the Shamrock. They put out the light, stole from the bunkhouse, and a short time later were riding quietly away into the night, heading once more for the Dakota Ranch. When they came within sight of the place the main building was lighted, but the rest of the premises was dark. They worked their way down to the edge of the great opening within which the ranch was situated. Rip left his horse concealed in some brush 200 yards from the corral and got up behind Lou. All right, go ahead, keeping the barn between us and the dwellings down there, Rip said. Riding slowly so that the sound of the hoof beats wouldn't be noticeable, they reached the huge barn. Rip slid down, went to a corner of the structure, peeped. All seemed very peaceful. He grinned mordantly when he thought of the excitement which would break out soon. He slithered along the back of the barn until he had the big pigeon house between himself and the shack of the Mexican caretaker, then like a great bounding cat he went straight for the cage. He had noticed that there were some tall broom weeds growing in rear of the structure. Another moment and he was lying among them, right alongside the back of the cage. Now it was up to Luke Cayley to carry out his part of the scheme. He had not long to wait. Evidently the old-timer had been watching him from the corner of the barn. Suddenly a horseman came rocketing out of the night. He bounced to a stop in front of the pigeon house. Powder lightning flashed in the blue gloom. Gun thunder jarred the night. Lou had shot the padlock from one of the caged doors. He seized the door and flung it open, gigged his horse, 
fired again, jerked the other door open. It all had happened within an instant, and now he was tearing away into the night, leaving pandemonium behind him. A dim, ghostly figure popped out of the shack. It was the Mexican watchman, in his nightshirt. There was a rumpus inside the bunkhouse, a stomping of boots within the main dwelling. The Mexican held a Winchester, and he began pumping lead in the direction from which hoofbeats were coming. The pattering quickly died in the night, and he ceased firing. Men were swarming out of the bunkhouse. The Dakotas were quickly running toward the barn and shouting to know what was the trouble. T. He Mexican yelled back an explanation of what had happened. Ned Dakota's voice came roaring. Close the doors, you damn fool. Close the doors. Some of the pigeons may get out. The guard hurried to obey. The hiding, listening cowboy wondered. What difference would it make if some of them did get out, at night? Ned called harshly to the men who had come out of the bunkhouse, guns in hand, go on back to bed. There's nothing you can do. By the time you got saddled that raider would be miles away. Slowly, then, the four cage gunnies streamed back indoors. Rip listened acutely to what was said by the Mexican caretaker and the Dakotas. Once more the watchman jabbered an explanation of what had happened. Ned Dakota remarked uneasily, Humphrey. Now why do you suppose he wanted to let the pigeons out? Silence for a moment, and then Cal reasoned slowly, maybe he belongs to some rival gang, and wants to get us mixed up with Lambert for some purpose, I wish I could figure out that fellow kid Davis, and his long-legged pal. Those two have me completely hooted. Ned growled, did you get a look at the rider, Comos? What was he like? I seen him not at all. By the time I jump out of bed, grab the gun and run into the open, he has already gone into the night. Did any of the pigeons quit the cage? That I do not know, say in your damnation, snapped Cal Hammer. We'd better send a rider down to Lambert's place. Should any of those colored pigeons show up there the whole works would be gummed up. Yes, well sent as he. As they moved away toward the bunkhouse Ned called back, sit up the rest of the night and watch that cage, Comos. We'll go into town tomorrow and get two more padlocks. Rip Campbell, lying flat on his belly amidst the tall broom weeds, felt grimly jubilant. His scheme had worked beautifully. He and Lou had hoped that in their excitement, not knowing that an eavesdropper was hidden nearby, the 4 cage men would talk. This the Dakotas had done, although their words had left him mystified. And so it was the colored pigeons, not the white ones, that meant something. Just what, he wondered. Why would their going to Lambert gum up the works? I'd better get out of here pronto, thought Rip. That caretaker will be eagle-eyed, once he gets dressed and plunks himself down on guard. The cowboy rose from the weeds and went gliding swiftly away toward the barn. Once behind the great building he would be safe, but again he must cross an open space. Comos had gone into the shack. The fellow must have glanced back through a window and seen him, for the next instant the ghostly figure popped into view again, in the doorway. Rip sensed that a rifle came up. He ducked so low that his chest almost struck his churning knees, it was well that he did so. The Winchester cracked viciously. Flame streaked in the gloom. A bullet zipped over Campbell's hunched form and bored through the barn wall. The cowboy snapped one of his own guns free and began blasting away. He was shooting at the door frame, however, not at the Mexican. He had no desire to down the watchman. The hot fire had the desired result. With a howl of dismay the Mexican whirled and vanished into the shack. He now began yelling again to the Dakotas. Ned and Cal had now reached the bunkhouse. Cursing furiously they came racing back, guns in hands. Rip heard a smashing and a tinkling of glass. The Mexican had rammed the barrel of his Winchester through a window pane. Once more the weapon spat fire and lead, but the cowboy was a dim, racing figure, and the guard missed. Rip felt the breeze of the passing bullet on the back of his neck. Just as he wheeled around a corner of the barn, came a third shot. The pellet tore splinters from the angle of planking, an inch behind his back. Now the barn was between him and the gunman, but there was yet 200 yards of open space between himself and the thicket wherein he had concealed his horse. If that fella runs out a little way, so as to bring me in the clear, he'll make it hot for me, thought Rip. He had told his friend to hightail it into the brakes and wait for him at a designated spot. Lou had said nothing, but the ex-ranger had harbored no thought of leaving his pal back there afoot, to make a getaway as best he could. Once out among the trees and bushes Lou had circled back. Now he came tearing out of the night, and as he rode he let out a yell so that his friend would know who was coming. Rip ran to meet him. Lou reared his horse to a stop, wheeled the animal, thrust down a rail-like arm. Rip Campbell seized it. Lou gigged his mount and heaved. As the horse snorted and lunged, Rip alighted behind the cantle. The next instant he and Lou Kelly were streaking away into the night. Behind them gunfire broke out. 
They lay very close to the running horse. Bullets snapped about them savagely for an instant, and then it was all over. The firing had ceased. They entered a stand of scrub cedars and went pounding on. There was no pursuit. The next morning, just as they were leading their saddled horses from the corral, they saw the hammers and three four cage gunnies come out of the mesquite and head toward them. I expected as much, Rip muttered. Get ready for gun trouble, partner. Chapter 8 The mounted party came up, deployed into a semicircle, and halted. Gents, Rip greeted easily. Lou Kelly merely bobbed his head. The visitors said nothing, just stared. After a while Rip Campbell prompted, Morning. Well, what's on your minds? Cal Dakota clipped out coldly, Somebody raided the 4 cage last night? Yeah? Yeah, tried to set all our pigeons free. His hard blue eyes, the coppery ones of his iron-jawed father, were drilling the two waddies suspiciously. Humphrey. Said Lou. Must have been somebody with humanitarian ideas. At least it was someone with ideas, growled Ned Dakota. There were two of the raiders, he said menacingly. Let's quit whipping the devil around the stump and get down to facts, Rip suggested boldly. You suspect me and my partner, is that it? If the boot fits, wear her. But why the heck would we want to turn your pigeons out? Protested Lou. Yeah, why? Cal asked flatly. That's what we want to know. Rip Campbell cocked his gray stits and head to one side and said deliberately, Dakotas, we're getting damn tired of being run over by you fellas. Sunday night you cracked us on our heads, then searched our persons and our effects. The two ranchmen looked startled. Then slowly Cal Dakota grinned maliciously, and the bullet scar on his left cheek pulled the otherwise handsome face slightly awry. Well, you see your doubtful characters, he tacitly confessed. Insolently. So are you. Rip rapped out on impulse. And now you come here accusing us of busting your cages and trying to turn out your pigeons. Ned Dakota, bulking like a great lump of rock in his saddle, growled determinedly, can you prove an alibi? Because if you can, we're taking you down to the Rio and giving you a chance to hit the long trail. Rip Campbell's gray eyes sparkled like glacier ice. His full chest rose and fell in a long, deep breath. The nostrils at the end of his straight nose pinched, then dilated and quivered. Once more he was thinking of the past, the deaths, the burning of the print shop, his life as an outcast. And here was the man behind it all, telling him that he must ride. The young gunner's voice was velvety, but dripping with menace nevertheless as he said, Yeah? Like hell. I don't have to offer any alibis to you. And get this. I'll shoot forty kinds of hell out of the first one of you that makes a fighting move. And I'll take up right where my partner leaves off, avowed Lou. There was ominous silence. What one brain can plot, another can solve. What's a new trick to a pup may be an old one to an experienced dog. Happens I used to be in the ranger service, and maybe I savvy about them pigeons. Cal's thin, mocking smile was gone. He yapped, yeah? Savvy what? We shall see, we shall see. Might be I'll suggest to the sheriff that it'll be a good idea to take over that whole mess of birds, to be held and studied plump thorough. The riders looked startled. Apparently here was a possibility which they had not foreseen. Cal's face went stony, that of his father dark with rage that seemed to tingle. Rip was crouched slightly, clean-muscled body perfectly balanced on spindly legs. His elbows were back and his wire-tendoned hands were spread in readiness to sweep the two Colt 45s from their holsters. His lips twisted away from set teeth in what was half a taunting smile, half a snarl. Lou Cayley drawled, Seems to me you two gents are making a lot of stink about them their birds. Leads a feller to believe there may be some crooked business in connection with them. Cal's eyes shimmered coldly. Did you find anything wrong when you examined them? The elder Dakota growled. You'd better keep your damned bill out of our affairs, you old buzzard, or you'll get it shot clean away. A new storm of anger and hatred swirled up within Rip. Once more he was thinking of the cold-blooded murder of his uncle ten years before. Recklessly, bitterly he snapped, any shooting you do, Ned Dakota, will likely come when your intended victim isn't expecting it. Suppressed fury half-choked Ned's hoarse voice as he rumbled. No man can get away with talking to me like you have, cowboy. Then suddenly his rage was unleashed and he was springing into battle. Rips lean, brown hands miraculously filled with gun butts. But that tricky, much-experienced gunfighter, Ned Dakota had reared his mount as he had chopped a hand toward his holster. Hold it. Snap trip, but Ned didn't stop the draw. The muzzle of the big six-shooter yawned, and the next instant was blotted out in a swirl of smoke. The slug went wild, for Campbell had shot first. Ned had escaped injury, however, by ducking and swinging the neck of his upright mount. The animal squealed as Rip's bullet ripped a bloody furrow across the neck. Then its four hoofs thumped to the ground and it began bucking. 
Taken by surprise, the heavyset rider fought to stay on. He could give no further attention to gunfighting in that moment. Campbell could easily have drilled him then, but the young gunfighter was not one to shoot a man who was unable to fight back. Cal had stabbed for hardware, too, but Lou Kaley's big hog leg already was out. No you don't. The ex-ranger yelped. Pull that cutter and I'll drill you. And so Cal's right hand froze on his pistol butt. Rip swung his guns toward the three four cage gunnies who had come there with the Dakotas. That goes for you hombres, too, he snapped. Ned's wounded mount pitched away to a distance of some forty yards from the corral before he got control of the animal. But the determined owner of the four cage came charging back, gun ready for action. Cut down on them, you damned fools, he roared at his gang. Webb got them outnumbered five to two. Riddle them with hot lead. No. Screamed Beth Prather's voice, wait. I dot can straighten out this whole thing. She came flying around a bow in the circular fence. Rip hoped to heaven the 4 cage man would heed her plea. She would. Be in great danger should lead start flying again. Guns rested immobile. Men stared hard at her. She halted, looked around a bit wildly for a moment. Then she called huskily to Cal Hammer, I heard what was said about the raid on the pigeons. What time copyright did it occur? E about half past nine last night? Why? A forced smile came to her lips. Then I can furnish an alibi for my two punchers. They were up at the ranch house, playing dominoes with mother and me until eleven o'clock. Rip and Lou stared at the girl in surprise. She did not look at either. Ned Dakota growled, Will your ma two time that alibi? She stiffened, tossed up her smooth chin. The little face was cold, haughty, the dark eyes hot. I beg your pardon, she said cuttingly. Ned hastened to mumble, I apologize. I wasn't accusing you of lying. It won't be necessary for you to prove your statement by your mother. Then he gave Rip a black look and added, but that don't plumb settle the quarrel. That bitter-mouthed young gunny said things that mean sace in any man's language. The fight was of your own making, she told him sharply. The girl was now in control both of herself and the situation. How dare you come here and bring gun trouble to my ranch? If you've got one shred of respect for me, you and Cal, take those gunnies of yours and go home. There was indecisive quiet for a moment, and then Cal Dakota's hard blue eyes turned back to Rip. There was an acrid, sneering smile on the fellow's cold lips. In mock apology he said, PM sorry if we've come here and accused innocent people, cowboy. We'll get the guilty parties some other time, maybe. It was mingled warning, regret, and costy humor. Rip Campbell quietly inclined his head and replied, some other time, Dakota, and his tone was prophetic. But his meaning wasn't the same as Cal's. The mounted party reigned about underscore and rode away. When it had disappeared into the mesquite, Rip turned once more to Beth Prether. Why did you do it? He asked her. She told him calmly, it was a fib to prevent bloodshed. Even a preacher would countenance such an act. Old Luke Haley chuckled and agreed, yeah, I don't reckon anybody in this world or the next could ever blame you for telling a white one like that. T.T. was brave and quick-witted of you to dash to her help like that, Rip told her. Tilda with a funny tittle smile she retorted, are you sure it was for you? His mouth flattened. His eyes they came like little swirling pools of smoke. Bitterly the cowboy blurted, Oh, I see. You were scared to death that me and my partner would pitch a few hot slugs into your boyfriend, huh? Again the slim form stiffened and the smooth chin went up. The red lips were very tight over small, white teeth. For a few seconds she glared at him, and then said angrily, I hate you. Wheeling, she went stamping angrily away toward the house, Luke Haley chuckled. Rip's lean jaws were hard for a moment as he gazed somberly at the stiff little back, and then he too burst into a laugh, a crazy sort of laugh. Lou quoted, when a gal says she hates a feller, says it like Bet did, it's a pretty good sign she likes him a heap. Rip's face went grim again. Tess not true in her case, he denied curtly. Chapter 9 The two punchers rode into town again that night. Judge Hugh J. Alberts found excuse to quit his job long enough to meet secretly and talk with them. There's still plotting going on between the Dakotas and Dax Bradwell, he confided. This time they conferred in Dax's private office, though, and so I have no idea what the talk was about. They thanked him for the information, asked him to continue keeping ears and eyes open. Then they went to see the sheriff. The rock-jawed lawman wagged his big head worriedly when they had told of the raid on the pigeon coops, and the ruckus at the clover leaf. I'm sorry you had gun trouble with them, he said. That'll make the wolves all the harder to trap. And the pigeons, well, at least we know now there's something mysterious in connection with them. I wonder what? Happen to know a fellow name of Lambert? Rip asked. 
Pike Lambert? Why, yes that is, I know of him. He runs a notorious cantina down in Tres Palos. Suspected smuggler, renegade, outfitter for desperados, go-between for bandits and revolutionists, all around bad hombre. How come you ask? Rip explained. The sheriff frowned and stroked his blunt chin. Um em. And so he's the power on the other end of the line, huh? And colored pigeons. I wonder what the Sam Hill. Guess I'll mosey out to the fork and have another look at them birds right soon. Colored pigeons. But it has always been the white ones we've seen in the air. Yeah, that's what gets me, Campbell sighed. Lambert's dive, on the other side. Hum mile per hour. Wish I was free to go over there and investigate, but I can't. My badge won't permit. Well, I don't wear a star, and I'm going, snapped Rip Campbell. The heavy-jawed sheriff gazed at him for a long time in silence. The astute lawman realized that it would be useless for him to argue against the plan, and so he merely warned, Be mighty careful, cowboy. If they get hep to you your life won't be worth shucks. I won't go prodding openly into a hornet's nest. A short time later the two waddies left by way of the rear door, the same way they had entered. They circled to their horses, mounted, and rode quietly away into the night. The hands at the shamrock ate at the family table. Rip and his pal did not see Beth Prather at breakfast the next morning. She had decided to take a ride in the refreshing coolness which preceded sunup. Mrs. Prather told them. Rip stared hard at the frail little woman, but she looked guileless. If there were some deep purpose behind the girl's unusually early morning ride, Mrs. Prather apparently knew nothing about it. Rip was just a little puzzled that Beth had made no mention of the raid on the 4-cage pigeon house. He had expected that she would ask many questions in that direction. He and Lou performed routine duties until mid-afternoon, and then Rip said, Well, I'll start moseying toward the Rio Grande. I aim to reach Lambert's cantina about dusk. I'd like to have a look at his pigeons by daylight. Old, Lou spat tobacco juice aside, squinted one eye toward the sun and replied, Yeah, I reckon we better be getting along. We. Sure, you didn't think for a minute I was going to let you enjoy all the fun alone? Shucks, no, I'm trotting right along. With you. But what about the women? They shouldn't be left at the ranch. Unprotected. You should stay in the bunkhouse and sort of guard. They won't be to home. Beth was absent from the table again at noontime, as you maybe noticed. He said the last four words sarcastically. After you'd stomped out, though, she come in and told me that her and Ms. Prather were spending the night with friends in town. She said that it would be up to us to fix our own supper tonight, and breakfast in the morning. So I'm going with you. Rip grinned, gave the lanky ex-ranger a good-natured poke in the ribs with a rock-hard fist. All right, you danged old maverick, come on. We'll have that supper in Trace Palos. They were riding leisurely along through the brakes, when of a sudden old Lou Cayley remarked, They're there again. Rip glanced up his eyes followed his pal's line of gaze. A flock of pigeons were coming out of Mexico, winging their way toward the 4-cage ranch. Yep, and they're all white, you'll notice. That's what gets me. From what I heard the other night, the Dakotas are concerned only about the colored ones. We've never yet seen one of them in flight. Uh-huh, it's right puzzlin'. But like most puzzles, I reckon she'll be plumb simple when we solve her. Maybe we'll find the solution at the other end of the bird trail. Maybe we'll find a lot of things. The sun was low as they splashed their bronzes across the broad, shallow ford. Small, golden sprays and showers played about the legs of their waiting horses. And. Then they climbed a wide stretch of mellow sand, followed a winding trail that led through the chaparral. It was dusk when they entered the adobe pueblo of Tres Palos. The whole place lay in somnolent apathy. A few ponies and burros dozed at hitch racks, chickens wandered about, picking now and then. A few lean pigs foraged along the dirty street. Peons dozed against walls and in doorways. The only sign of animation was in the form of a flock of dirty, half-naked children who were playing hide-and-seek among the shacks and store buildings. Looks harmless enough, observed Lou. Rip replied acridly, yeah, so does a sleeping tiger, until he's prodded. These sleepy, lazy pueblos can become roaring, blasting hellholes within an instant, partner. Lou chuckled, don't I know it? I ain't exactly a greenhorn on the border, you know. Fact, I was right in the line when you was sucking your thumb and saying goo goo. Rip gave him the withering look, and they rode on. They did not ask for directions to Lambert's cantina. They did not want to show themselves to be total strangers in Trace Palos. 
but when they had traversed the entire extent of the main street without seeing a sign which would identify the place, Rip said to his friend, Humphrey. Looks like we might have to ask somebody, after all. Look, maybe that's her over there. Lou pointed to a big, square, two-story adobe building which stood within a grove of giant cottonwoods. Rip Campbell leaned forward in his saddle and peered intently. He had the eyes of a hawk, and soon he announced, Yeah, that's it. I can make out some of the big letters painted across its face. A lazy-looking gringo was sitting humped in the doorway, smoking a cigarette as they approached. He got up, stretched, and stepped out of sight into the building. But despite the show of sluggish indifference he had put on, the partners knew that he had gone to give news of the approach of two strangers. They found only a few people within the place. In the back part of the great room was a lunch counter. They had drinks, then went and ordered ham and eggs, and potatoes, from a dagger-eyed highly painted senorita. They asked to be allowed to wash up. A slovenly, seemingly speechless dishwasher conducted them to a back room, just as Rip had hoped would happen. The fellow motioned to wash pans, soap, a bucket of water and a dirty towel. They fell to, lathering, scrubbing, snorting. Through suds and a dingy window Rip Campbell saw a pigeon house, like the one at the 4-Cage ranch. He also saw that it was guarded by a Mexican who sat in a nearby doorway. He cleaned his glowing face of lather and looked around. The dishwasher was gone. Rip whispered to Lou. No chance to examine the birds by daylight. After night, though, we'll take care of that watchman, then have a look-see inside the coop. I hope we don't stop too much lead while doing it, muttered Lou. The food was very good. The two cowboys ate slowly, despite their wolfish appetites, for they had a good deal of time to kill. A chunky man with nearly white eyes, a blonde mustache, and a forced smile came and asked them if everything was all right. They assured him that it was. He introduced himself, Pie Clambert, proprietor of the place, and his pale eyes drilled the two waddies interrogatively. They merely nodded, and ate on. Lambert sat down and pretended to be sociable, grinning, asking seemingly casual questions. They realized, however, that he was trying to get a line on two men whom his experienced eyes had spotted as lead slingers. Ripped at all the answering. His innuendo and ambiguous replies left Pie Clambert baffled, just as had been the case with the Dakotas when they first had interrogated the cowboy. Darkness came, and the two Wadis quietly left the dive. They circled and came up to the pigeon house. Just as they had expected would happen, the guard immediately appeared. He held a rifle and he challenged them sharply. Rip approached the fellow casually. It's all right, he said. We're in the know. You're supposed to let the colored pigeons go tonight. Huh? At night? The boss say so? He eyed them more closely. Who are you, anyway? I know see you before. I call the boss. I. Rip was close now, and like a bobby he sprang. His left hand knocked the rifle aside. His right drew a six-shooter. Not a cheap out of you, hombre or I'll have to shoot. Let go the Winchester." The fellow tried to jerk the rifle away, and his mouth opened to voice a cry for help. Rip hit out with his gun. The Mexican slumped. They bound and gagged him with neckerchiefs, then hurried into the pigeon house. Rip tore a piece of lathing from a wall and made a torch. Dangerous business. Anyone passing that would surely have seen the light. As luck would have it, though, the two Waddies made a complete inspection of the two-room pigeon house in peace. Not a thing out of the way did they find. Rip grinned and plucked a quill from the tail of a dark blue, almost black pigeon. A souvenir for the sheriff, he said, to show him we really did go bird hunting tonight. They left the place, again baffled. But once more Rip Campbell had the feeling that there was some deeply sinister business in connection with those pigeons that they in some way stood for crime, subtle trickery, even death. In the meantime unbeknown to the two Wadis new danger had cut their trail. Danger in the form of the hammers and a rat-faced killer from Sonora. The Dakotas had just entered the dive. By Clambert introduced the little gunny, told his allies that the fellow was widely traveled, gun-wise, keen of brain, just the kind of man the Dakotas needed. At this juncture Rip and Lou walked back into the cantina. The ex-ranger had left his squirt on the lunch counter. The bar room was fairly well crowded now, and so the partners did not see the little group of plotters at a table near the back part of the bar room. As they turned and started to leave, the gunny noticed them. His little black eyes showed leaping interest. Look, he exclaimed softly. Rip. Does he work for you folks? 
For if he does you've certainly got a good man. That cowboy is chain lightning with his sixes. Both the Dakotas had tensed. Cal now started half up from the table. His glance flew to the two cowboys who were walking down the room. Rip? He blurted. Yes, Rip Campbell. You've heard of him I see, and no wonder, if you've traveled in Mexico much. He was right noted while right in range up in Sonora, people there are a wondering what became of him. Cal Dakota muttered hoarsely, though while he ran fingertips along the ragged scar on his left cheek. Campbell. Rip Campbell. Rip. No wonder we saw something familiar in that face, Dad. And then his blue eyes flamed. Throughout the years there had been venom in his heart because of the scar on his cheek, the scar which he considered a serious blemish to an otherwise handsome face. He straightened his splendid form and dropped a hand to his pistol. Instantly the rat-faced killer grabbed Cal's wrist and said, Hell, no, fella. If you're thinking of gun-tangling with Rip Campbell, that cowboy is lightning, I tell you. He's right, Ned Dakota urged swiftly. He took Dax Bradwell, you know, and Dax is fast. You won't be trying to out-trigger a printer boy this time, but Rip Campbell, a cowboy who has steel wires for nerves and lightning in both hands. Wait and we'll get him from trailside. I'm taking him right here, Cal gritted. Matching my draw hand against his. I've wished a long time for this chance. Now that I've got it I don't aim to let it pass. He took one step away from the table, and then bad luck for Campbell and Lou struck again. The pigeon guard had regained consciousness, managed to free himself from his insecure bindings, and now he came hurrying into the cantina, a rifle in his hands. Senor Quincy! He cried. They knock me cold, then go into the Pegan house. There were snarled ejaculations, for every man in the dive at the moment was an ally of the Dakota Lambert crime organization. Reaching for hardware, gunnies came up from tables. Pike Lambert was cursing softly. The rifleman, still a little goofy from the blow he had suffered, pitched his Winchester to his shoulder and fired. Rip Campbell heard a pig in his hat crown. Felt a bullet wing through his hair. It flew on and bored a hole through a wall. The attack coming so suddenly had caught him and Lou unprepared. Both seasoned adventurers, they were quick to act in the emergency, however. Their guns flew into their hands. They both fired, then whirled, ran to the lunch counter, vaulted over it, ducked, went pounding through the back door. In the bar room two gunnies were moaning now, one nursing a wounded shoulder, the other a bleeding hand. In the excitement of the moment the whole gang in the bar room surged impulsively after the two waddies, given no thought to the fact that the cowboys' horses were out front. This was a break for Rip and Lou. They ran around the building, hastily got into leather, and went streaking away. But a mounted band was quickly on their tails. Guns began popping and lead whistled about them. They did not return the fire, but gave all their attention to hard riding. Anxiously their eyes watched the course of the Rio Grande. Would they make it? Once more they looked behind. Some of them are catching up with us, muttered Lou. Naturally a few of the Cayuses in that bunch are faster than ours. Shall we hole up and make a fight of it? What chance would we have against so many? No, we must keep hightailing, and hope. Okay, partner, but I think they'll catch us. The river won't stop them. Chapter 10 The Rio Grande came out of the night, a broad streak of silver. The two cowboys hit the water at full speed and this time it was silver spray which flew. Bullets made small, chugging sounds all about them. Rip and Lou were returning the fire now. Before, the shooting of the pursuers had been wild, for accurate six-gunning cannot be done from running horses at night from any considerable distance. Now, though, it was hot and dangerous. Looks like we ain't going to outride them, partner, said Lou. Let's hole up on the other bank and try to fight them back while they're in the river. At that instant rifle fire broke out on the east shore. It came from a flank, and it sent horses dropping and floundering into the stream. Friends! Whooped Lou. Thank gosh! I wonder who it can be. Sheriff John Nelson and a deputy, maybe, Nelson said he'd like to help out in tonight's investigation but that his badge wouldn't permit him to cross the river. Riders were piling up back there in the Rio Grande. Oaths, shouts of rage, a terrific sloshing and splashing, gunfire, the night was a bedlam. During that moment of surprise and confusion the two wadis tore out of the stream, up a sandbank, and into the chaparral. Immediately the shooting ceased. Evidently the stinkers are hightailing it back, muttered Lou Cayley. Nice of our unknown friends not to keep pouring lead into them while they're exposed out there. They swung around through the brush and made toward the spot from which the rifle fire had come. 
they reared their mounts to a halt as two men with Winchesters in their hands stepped suddenly out of a nest of snaggled rocks and confronted them. Rip Campbell called cheerfully, John Nelson and Judge Alberts. Gosh, are we glad to see you two gents. Lambert's gang likely would have got us if you hadn't started cracking down. We had an idea you might need help, so we moseyed down this way, growled the sheriff. What happened over there? Rip told him. The lawman muttered, um em, more pigeons. There's something in connection with them, but for the life of me I can't imagine what it is. I went out to the fork H and examined those colored birds today, but found no clue to the mystery. I got the idea that Cal Dakota was mocking me all the time while he was showing me the birds. We'll keep on investigating until we get to the bottom of the whole thing, Rip declared. It'll be harder from now on, more dangerous for you, since the Dakotas know your real identity. You'd better watch your step, cowboy. It'll warn them that if they jump you, or lay a trap for you. Don't worry about me. I can take care of myself. No man can take care of himself if he rides into an ambush such as that gang might lay. Yeah. I'll warn them. It still was quite early in the night, so Rip and Lou rode into Tejas with Nelson and the judge. Alberts turned his mount over to the sheriff and slipped away to the Crazy Horse Saloon, there to take up his regular post at the card table. Rip accompanied Nelson to the town stable, so as to have a few last words with him while the sheriff was putting up his own and the judge's mounts. Lou had stopped off at a pool hall, and had said that he would wait for Rip there. The two men parted company a short time later. John Nelson heading for his office, Rip Campbell moseying thoughtfully along the street, smoking a cigarette. But this time his mood was not one of abstraction. Remembering attacks upon him in that town, he was very alert. The public didn't know that it was a gang led by Tezzy who had beaten him up one night that it was the Dakotas who had slugged him in the hotel room. But after tonight, all the black kittens will be out of the bag at one and the same time, he thought. He arrived opposite the Crazy Horse Saloon and stopped. Sounds of body revelry were coming from over there. He saw a tall, straight shadow moving along beneath the porch awnings. It turned in at the saloon, pushed the batwing doors apart. Rip had just a glimpse of Dax Bradwell, and then the man disappeared. The cowboy took a long pull at his cigarette, sent smoke trickling through his nose. A hard, thin smile formed little crinkles at the corners of his eyes and his mouth. His right hand strayed into the inside pocket of his brush jacket and fingered the quill which he had plucked from a pigeon's tail, over on the other side of the line. He had forgotten to give that little souvenir of adventure to John Nelson. Now, acting upon a reckless impulse, he headed straight across the street and toward the double doors of Dax Bradwell's dive, a place which he knew was very dangerous for him. Rip Campbell stepped slowly into the place, pushed back his Stetson, and stood with thumbs hooked in the waistband of his Levi's. As men noticed him a stunt hush swiftly settled over the room. The crazy horse was supposed to be a forbidden place for him, since his fistic encounter with the gambler on the first day of his arrival in Tejas. Naturally, now, his coming there portended excitement. Even Judge Hugh J. Alberts had ceased to move. Rip saw a question in the man's eyes. The cowboy did not attempt to answer it with his own. He looked toward the bar. Dax Bradwell, immaculate as ever was standing behind it and between two white-coated tenders. He had frozen in the act of taking a drink. Rip's cold eyes flickered, and with a mere ghost of a smile on his thin lips he went slowly to the rail, leaned easily on it and looked into Bradwell's thin face. The dive owner suddenly came alive. He whacked his glass onto the bar and rapped out, What are you doing in my place, Gunny? You know you're about as welcome as a lobo in a chicken house. Rip's chilling smile spread just a little. The frosty eyes narrowed. Very softly he said, or a pigeon house? Instantly Bradwell's visage became marble. The black eyes glowed in a startled way. For just a moment he gazed speechlessly, and then in a low, deliberate tone he asked, meaning just what? Carelessly Rip took the pigeon feather from his inside pocket, absently flicked the rail with it. Oh, nothing underscore in particular. He put his tongue into one cheek, looked up from under arched brows, and grinned mysteriously. Bradwell was staring at the feather gun hand for the as if fascinated. It was almost coal black there in the lamplight. For the gambler it obviously held sinister portent. He was reading dreadful meaning from seeing it within the mocking cowboy's possession. His eyes were intensely questioning as he raised them to the bleak, sardonic ones in the cowboy's bronzed face. In that same velvety voice that was scarcely above a whisper Rip suggested, Shall we have a little private powwow, in your office? Dax Bradwell continued to gaze at him for a moment, then gulped and bobbed his, head in agreement. 
he wheeled and went striding down the room, Rip followed him, slouching along like a lazy cat. It had been mostly a rash whim that had carried Rip Campbell into the crazy horse. It had seemed unlikely that he could profit much by trying to bluff the trick-wise, flinty-faced gambler. Now suddenly, though, he was believing that his little game might produce an important win for him. He was planning rapidly as he followed Dax Bradwell. The owner of the crazy horse dropped into a chair at a table and motioned Rip to one opposite him. The cowboy sat down, squared himself around so that his right hand gun was easily accessible. He still held the blue-black feather, and he began idly flicking the edge of an ashtray with it. Surreptitiously he was watching Bradwell from under the lowered brim of his Stetson. After a moment of silence that must have been nerve-straining to Dax Bradwell, the man prompted gruffly, Well? Rip's face came up then, and there were taunting devils in his eyes. In the velvety, slightly sibilant voice which held such alarming innuendo, such mocking suggestion, he told the slim, stiff-backed gambling man. The game's up, Bradwell. The, the game? What are you talking about? You know very well. But what you don't know is that I went across the line tonight, to Pie Clambert's place. I ran into your pals over there. I captured the keeper of the pigeons. I went through the cages. I did a lot of things. He paused and grinned knowingly. Bradwell had donned a stone mask, but again Rip saw him swallow hard, knew thereby that the fellow was excited. Bradwell tried to hold his tone even and emotionless as he said, meaning just what? Rip Campbell tossed the colored feather in front of the dive owner and said, You ought to know. Once I report my findings to the sheriff, yeah, the game is up, Bradwell. You might help yourself by coming along with me to the sheriff and confessing everything. It was a colossal bluff. Rip didn't expect it to be entirely successful, but he did hope that in shooting at the bullseye he would at least score something. He was mildly surprised when Dax Bradwell said hurriedly, All right, he'll come clean. I'll put it in writing. But you must promise me. Hold it. Rip Campbell had seen poison suddenly gleam in the black eyes. Bradwell had slid his long, pale hands from the table edge into a shallow drawer in front of him. Through the cowboy's mind had left suspicion that the fellow was about to draw a gun, not writing materials. Bradwell's lips flicked away from set teeth. He cursed and jerked the drawer. The thunder of a shot jarred the room. That shot had come from a pistol hidden within the drawer and rigged so as to hurl lead straight forward from under the table. He hadn't dared try for his hip gun. As Rip had yapped at Bradwell to hold it, his lithe form had bounded aside and one leg had reached out on a stride to get around a corner of the table. The bullet brushed past his right hip and smashed into the top slat of the chair back. Both Rip's six-shooters flew from leather, the right one first. As the muzzles of the weapons jumped up, the now ashen-faced gambler ducked. The short gun bellowed. A slug tore up a row of splinters in front of the place where the fear-frozen visage had been an instant before. With a jerked axe Bradwell overturned the table so as to have some protection for himself, and perhaps hoping also to extinguish the light. But the brass lamp merely suffered a broken chimney. It rolled across the room, brought up against a wall. For an instant the light wavered and darkness almost closed in, then a flame sprang up and began to grow. The cap had been twisted aside and kerosene was oozing out. Meanwhile vivid action was going on within the room. While the place underscore was shrouded in gloom the two men had been firing. Jets of flame came over the top of the upset table. It seemed to Rip that ghostly fingers were jerking at his clothing. His own guns were pounding as he sprang nimbly about, and he could hear a steady hammering of lead. Altogether it was an infernal din. And then as the flame from the burning lamp sprang higher, lighting the office with a weird glare, Dax Bradwell lost his nerve and began yelling surrender. Rip Campbell did not trust the man. He feared a trick. The cowboy was near the up edge table now, and with a bound he went over it, spurred heels gathered under him, a Colt 45 gripped in each fist. On one elbow, like a trapped beast, Bradwell looked up and saw him coming. He snarled and tipped up his pistol for another shot, then Campbell hit him, one boot crashed aside the six shooter and the hand which held it, so that the load went through the ceiling. The other stomped against Bradwell's chin. The man's head thumped hard against the floor. Rip stumbled on and careened against a wail. Outside there was wild excitement. Voices were yapping and feet were scurrying. The door flew open and men came pouring in. At the forefront of the crowd were Judge Alberts and Luke Haley. Dax Bradwell was lying on the floor, stunned. Campbell was standing crouched against a wall commodate Colt 45 gripped in each brown fist. Men were craning necks. Some of them sprang to put out the fire. 
a bartender brought a fresh light. Lou Cayley said to his pal, from up the street I seen you come in here, to a point of disclosing secrets of the Dakota Bradwell Lambert gangs. Sure, I've got something to tell, growled Dax Bradwell, as he wiped blood from the cut on his chin, but I can say it right here. The cowboy tried to hold me up, to make me unlock the safe. He had a dead drop on me, so, use the gun I had rigged in the drawer for just such an emergency. Come along, both of you, John Nelson ordered quietly. We can thrash the whole thing out down at my place. But both men stuck to their stories, and since there were no witnesses except themselves, Nelson released Bradwell. When the gambler had returned to his dive, Rip gave and figured something might happen. How come the gunfight? At that moment there was a jostling in the crowd. Sheriff John Nelson came shoving into the room. Yeah, what happened? He demanded authoritatively. Dex Bradwell was picking himself up now. Rip said tersely, I was having a little private talk with the scamp, when he tried to murder me with a trick gun rigged up in the table drawer. Better bring him along to your office, Sheriff. I think he has something he wants to tell you. The cowboy quickly saw his hope in the direction go glimmering. He found that he had not bluffed the man the law and all the facts in the case. Nelson remarked, not being sure just how far you were bluffing, he intended to shut your mouth and at the same time get revenge so he tried to kill you. What do you want me to do next? Just sit tight, let things ride, replied Rip. I played that hand out. Now we'll shuffle the cards and wait for the next dot del. Rip was glum as he and Lou headed for the home ranch. Now with his identity known, would the hammers make it tough for the Prathers? Of course they might claim that they had been unaware dot of his true identity, but the ever-suspicious Dakotas probably wouldn't believe. At any rate they would demand that he be fired. And what would Beth do? The cowboy grimly decided that he would have a complete showdown with her when she returned to the ranch in the morning. The two Waddies alternately stood guard that night, for they had expected the Dakotas to come there. But they were not disturbed. The Prathers returned at mid-morning. The mother went straight into the house. Lou was pretending to busy himself at the horse corral. Rip soberly told Beth of the happenings of the night. He explained everything and then added, if Lou and I stayed on here it would get you in bad with the Dakotas, and so. You're staying, she told him decisively. I guess my game with Cal was about played out anyway. Game? She nodded. I've been in school for quite a while when father died. After I took over the ranch Cal made a play for me. I wanted to help trap that band, so I tolerated his unwelcome attentions. She smiled coldly. He told me you tried to dry gulch him in that fight ten years ago, and I pretended to believe him, Cal Hammer hasn't fooled me for an instant. Then why did you spy on us when we were examining those pigeons we killed the other day? The question had come flatly. His eyes were cold and drilling, but she did not cringe before his stare. Because I'd heard shooting, and went to investigate. I didn't want you to know of my game, yet, so I ran away. I wanted to be present when you fellows inspected the pigeons at the ranch, though, and I arranged it accordingly. Why haven't you confided in your friends before? Because my game was a deep and dangerous one. I was afraid that if I took my friends into my confidence somebody might in some way inadvertently tip off the Dakotas. In that case, there's no telling what might happen to me. He expected visit from the Hammers came shortly past midday. Beth Prather met them at the front door. She did not ask them into the house knowing very well that they had come for a showdown. They were quick to notice her unaccustomed coldness, and doubtless to guess the reason for it. Ned Dakota growled bluntly, Beth Prather, we've found out that the two-gunner you've got working here is Rip, the young skunk who tried to murder Cal ten years ago. We've come to tell you that you've got to get rid of him. Frail Mrs. Prather stood listening anxiously a few feet behind her daughter. She called in a trembling whisper, Oh, honey, do be careful. The girl laid a hand confidently on a shotgun which stood against the door frame near her right side. She said in reply to Ned Dakota's growled statement, Rip Campbell, eh? Where'd you get your information, Mr. Dakota? Over in Mexico, blurted Ned. Is that so? What were you doing in Mexico? The two men exchanged glances. Ned's big face was slightly red. Cal's scarred one was a bit pale with anger. Ned snarled went over to warn that fellow Lambert that we suspect him of rustling 4 cage beef. Rip and that long-legged part of his were in the dive. Rip was recognized by a gunny from Sonora. Then a man came in and yelped that your two waddies conked him and robbed him, Lambert's gang chased the pair clean across the border. And just why do you want me to get rid of Rip? We don't want a, fellow of his stripe so close to our spread. 
if he ain't up to some devilment, why did he call himself Kid Davis, and try to get a job on the 4 cage? Rip stays. He's an old friend of mine. He changed his name at the sheriff's request, to keep from having trouble with you too. Cal's eyes seemed to snap. Oh, so you've known who he was all along? You were stuck on him when he was a yellow printer's pup, you still are. It's easy to see you were working with him against us. I guess you think you've made a fool out of me but you haven't. You'll see. He then went into a bitter, blistering tirade. His father joined him from time to time, snarling deep in his throat. Threats were hurled, and then came interruption. Rip Campbell and Luke Haley had been watching and waiting inside the house. When they had seen the Dakotas coming they had slipped out the back door. As the two 4 cage men had come stomping down the walk, Rip and his partner had wheeled away in opposite directions and circled toward the front of the house. Now they stepped suddenly from behind the two front corners. Cal and Ned jerked visibly. Their glances shuttled between the two menacing cowboys. Old Lou was perfectly cool. His hard jaws worked methodically as he chewed tobacco. His long mustache moved gently in the warm breeze. But once more Rip was like a clean-limbed, ferocious young tiger, and no wonder. The men who had murdered his uncle, and perhaps his father, also the one who had tried to kill him ten years ago were before him. They had been bemeaning and threatening the girl he loved. There was a snap to his voice as he said. Beth didn't make a fool out of you, Cal Dakota. You always were one also a skunk, like you're murdering. Dad. Now ski daddle, both of you. And get this, if you think you're going to dot do any terrorizing around this ranch you'd better forget it. If you try it, you'll get shot. Now travel, you polecats. Ned Dakota's eyes glowed like molten copper. Cows were like ice. Ned was more battle was than his hot-headed son. Taking a glance to the right, another to the left, he swallowed hard and said, Come on, son, they've got us this time, could butcher us with crossfire. We'll wait, and shoot it out with them sometime later. You mean you will set a dry gulch trap for us later, sneered Rip. I'll be damned if I'll wait, husked Cal, his voice shaky with fury. I've hoped for this chance a long time, and I'm going to have it out with Campbell. You'll have to take care of that long-legged jackass at the other corner. Cal went into a slight crouch then, shoulders hunched. The scar across his cheek was a livid gash. His lips twisted away from his set teeth, and he snarled, Draw, you. Stop it. Beth's voice rang out like a bell, a very determined bell. All eyes shot toward her. Her dark eyes were flashing, and there were angry red spots on her otherwise pale cheeks. Her lips were thin to a pink line. Cal Dakota again started visibly, for she was holding a shotgun, and it was pointed straight at his breast. Travel, you Dakotas. She clicked out, get off this ranch, and stay off. All right, gal, let's go, said Ned. Cal straightened his big form slowly, took a deep breath. There was hell in his eyes. He licked dry lips. Suddenly he whirled and went stamping away down the walk. Ned followed him. They flung themselves astride leather. Cal fairly shouted, You'll regret this day, Beth Prather. And as for you two hairpins, it swore between us from now on. He whirled his mount then, and went riding furiously away. With him rode his rock rag of a dad. Chapter 11 much to the surprise of everyone at the Shamrock, all was quiet there during the next few days. The Dakotas gave them no trouble. Maybe it's because the sheriff warned them he was going to hold them responsible if anything happened to us, Rip Campbell told his friends. He said he was going to do that. In which case they're just waiting until they can see a chance to gun us out, and at the same time have an alibi, opined Luke Haley. Since all had been so quiet at the ranch, Beth had not hired other hands but of a sudden cattle began to disappear. She told Rip and Lou, the rustling must stop, or Mother and I will be in desperate circumstances. Rip said grimly, the quickest, surest way would be for me to ride straight to the 4 cage and shoot the daylights out of the Dakotas. Get that idea out of your head, Beth admonished him hurriedly. They probably hope you'll try just that, so they can kill you and have it out. We have no absolute proof of their guilt, you know. It proved to be good advice. The very next day Rip and Lou found the missing cattle grazing peacefully within a hidden valley. A fallen tree had closed the single narrow entrance. The cowboys found upon inspection that dynamite had caused the tree's fall. Foxy scheme, growled Lou. Knowing they'd be suspected immediately, the Dakotas didn't dare steal the herd, so they just penned the cows here. The purpose was tuply, to worry Beth, 
and to bring us ranting to their spread, where they could kill us and then claim self-defense. They pulled the tree away with their last ropes, then rode in and hazed the cattle out. Beth was both delighted and worried when she heard the news. You see how cunning they are. We must be very careful. T. He next morning while he and his partner were riding Range Rip made a startling discovery. He jabbed out a finger and barked, look. The colored pigeons in flight, at last. Some of them, at least, muttered Lou. About half the flock is white, the rest colored. Let's hightail to the crest of yonder hill and watch the fork H through our glasses. Rip raked his mount with the rowels. The two cowboys witnessed a strange happening. A man popped out of the shack which was near the wire netting. He ran to the cages, peered at the newly arrived birds, then wheeled and went running toward the house. He disappeared indoors, only to come out a moment later, followed by a second man. Rip muttered, that other Jasper is Ned Dakota, judging by his bulk. The two hurried down to the cages, and now they stared for a moment. Slowly they turned, stood talking for a while. Finally Ned went striding toward the house. The guard disappeared into the shack. Humphrey, mumbled Rip. They seemed right excited about the birds. And yet, all they did was look at them through the netting. Didn't even lay a hand on any of them. She's a humdinger of a mystery, declared Lou. They watched the ranch until noontime, saw riders come in off the range and troop away to the cook shack. When the gang emerged from the midday meal the whole ranch became a scene of hustling activity. Some of the men went immediately to the horse corral, saddled up, and rode away toward Tejas. Others disappeared into the bunkhouse, no doubt to do it up a little before hitting the trail. But when they did ride, they underscore two headed toward town. And still no one had handled a single one of the pigeons. It's evident the birds didn't bring nothing on them, since they weren't touched. Yet their arrival created a lot. Of excitement down there at the Dakota Ranch, muttered the old ex-ranger, as he tugged thoughtfully at his mustache. What the heck does it mean? I'd sure like to ride down there and have a look-see inside the cages myself, but half a dozen of the gang stayed at the ranch. Suppose we take a ride into town? Suggested Rip. Trail those riders in? Maybe we'll get some idea of what's up? Smart thought, but we must watch our steps. With that gang in Tejas, we might have to shoot our way out. Rip muttered a little worriedly, Beth and. Her mother were going into town for the mail this morning. I hope they don't run into Cal Dakota, not before. We get there, anyway. Maybe this is the day we shoot her out with them too, huh? Not we this time partner, just me. They're both mine. Then they rode into Tejas. Their keen eyes noted at once that. Four cage broncos were packed like sardines along the hitch rack in front of the crazy horse saloon. The two waddies were hawk-like in their alertness as they rode along, for they realized that the tough town might be dynamite for them at that particular moment. As they passed the crazy horse they heard sounds of rough hilarity. Already, the first of the four cage riders to arrive there, were feeling. Their liquor. Two fellows lurched out of the place, and instinctively. The two riders halted short, hands dropping to gun butts but the other men paid them no heed. Perhaps they were not 4 cage men. They went stomping down the sidewalk and entered a pool hall. Rip's quick eyes noted an important-looking figure strolling along from the direction of a hood a big man who wore a soft black hat, a flowing black tie and a cream-colored vest, and a long black coat. Rip grinned. There's Judge Alberts, he told his saddle part. Doesn't he look for all the world like a congressman? Lou sent a jet of tobacco juice aside. He dragged the back of a bony hand across his lips, then remarked dryly, yeah, a congressman at large. One that shouldn't be at large. There he chuckled. Rip called from a corner of his mouth as they rode. Slowly past the gambler, hey, judge, mosey back to the sheriff's office after a while. We want to make powwow. The big man nodded without looking at them, and went strolling. Rip Campbell had been looking for the Prather buckboard, and now he spotted it standing in front of the post office. As the Waddies approached the vehicle the two women came out. The cowboys paused to warn. Them that the Dakota gang was in town, drinking hard and. That perhaps. It would be just as well dot if Beth and her mother hit. The trail for the home. Ranch at once. If Cal Dakota Camito be here with the. Outfit, he. May try to get high handed with you again, Rip. Told. Beth. We don't want to be the cause of any trouble, the girl said seriously. We'll go just as sore as we bought a few necessaries at Simpson's General Store. All right, go ahead and do your shopping. Lou and I want to powwow with the law for a few minutes then we'll trail you home. They touched their Stetsons and rode away. 
Once more they called at John Nelson office cautiously, by way of the back door. This time they did not find him in. He was up at the crazy horse, keeping an eye on the rowdies there, a deputy told them. I'll go take his place, though, and send him down here, the lawman said. Rip Campbell stationed himself at a place where he could watch the front door of the general merchandise establishment wherein Beth and her mother were doing their shopping. He still was afraid that Beth might be approached and threatened by Cal Dakota. Judge Hugh J. Alberts came in, also by way of the back door. The political and religious situation in this town is becoming very bad, he remarked, as he carefully gathered up the tail of his long black coat and sat down. Lou Cayley chortled and said, You old scalawag! I'll bet them hidden shooting irons of yours, and the frog sticker down your back, are all primed for trouble. The judge glared at him, then looked at Rip. He winked and said, Lou just will have his little jokes. That moment the sheriff entered the office, and the four men got right down to business. Rip told about the happenings at the four cakes that day. The judge pursed his lips, nodded and remarked, I was in the crazy horse when that first batch of four cage riders entered the place. Cal Dakota was with them. He and Dax Bradwell immediately went into conference in the private office. There seemed to be an undercurrent of eager excitement about the whole outfit. Pigeons. And yet they apparently don't carry contraband or messages. Um em. In all my political career I've never come in contact with anything so puzzling. I reckon that's because your political career has kept your nose stuck close to a deck of cards, Lou told him dryly. I guess it'll be useless, sighed John Nelson, but maybe I'd better ride out there and have another look at those birds. Rip told him with conviction, it would be a waste of time. You wouldn't find a thing wrong. I've been doing a lot of hard thinking since witnessing what I did at that ranch today, Sheriff, and doggone if I don't believe I've hit upon the solution of the mystery, or at least a clue to it. The others showed immediate interest. He went on, maybe the birds themselves are the messages. Maybe the flights of the whites mean one thing, the flights of the colored ones something else. The sheriff whacked muscular thighs and exclaimed, by George, maybe that is it. I hadn't thought of that. Oomph. I had, and was just going to suggest it, pompously announced Judge Alberts. Like how you were, Lou told him. Them feathered critters ain't got diamonds, hearts, clubs or spades on them, so how could you know anything about them? The judge glared at him again, then he rubbed his bulbous nose humorously. Rip Campbell muttered something under his breath and came suddenly out of his chair, his gaze upon a nearby window. John Nelson asked quickly, What's the matter, cowboy? Beth Prather just came out of the general store, and a couple of fellas who'd stopped in front of the place are staring at her. One of them looks sort of pickled. I'll go up there and, no, it won't be necessary. They've turned and are moseying away. The other men joined him at the window. The sheriff said acridly, you should have recognized the pickled one, Rip. That's Tessie, the big blabbermouth you tangled with the first day you arrived here. Yeah, and so it is. Rip observed softly. Now I wonder what they said to her, if anything. We'll find out right soon, maybe, spoke Kaylee. Looks like she's coming here. Beth Prather had deposited some packages in the buckboard. Her mother had not emerged from the store. The girl was now walking briskly along the street. Tezzy and the other tough had stopped and were watching her. Two doors from the sheriff's office she turned into a dress shop. Evidently she went right on through the building, for the next moment she entered Nelson's office by the rear door. The two toughs moved on. What happened up there? Rip asked quickly. Did those two skunks? No, they didn't say a word to me, but I heard something I thought the sheriff should know at once. I came out of the store suddenly, and heard Tezzy say, I reckon we'll ride again tonight, since the colored flock come over today. Bradwell and Cal are talking it over, and then the other cowboy noticed me, and I heard him warn in a low voice, Shut up, you damned fool. The Prather girl. They stared at me for a moment but I tried to look innocent, as if I hadn't heard a thing, then they turned and walked on. They watched me when I headed this way, though. I guess they were afraid I was coming here. That's why I went through the dress shop and entered this place by the back door. You see, Sheriff? Rip said excitedly. It's just like I told you. The birds are used as signals back and forth. He wheeled then and said to Beth, you run along. Jay'll tell you all about it later. Just stay inside the general store until my part and I join you. She left the same way that she had entered. The four men quickly form who underscore later a plan. That gang has got something on for tonight, Rip declared. Lou and I want to guard the Prathers during their trip home. But when we're through trailing them to the Shamrock, we'll then go keep an eye on the Dakota Ranch. 
You two fellas watch Bradwell and his gunnies. Okay? Good. The sheriff agreed grimly. It's a cinch they've got some crooked business on with Bike Lambert, and this time we want to catch them red-handed. They talked for a moment longer, and then Lou and Rip slipped out. The judge followed a short time later. Lou Cayley rode back home in the buckboard with Mrs. Prather. Beth and Rip Campbell. Rode the two saddle horses. It was Beth's idea. She was curious to know what it was Rip had to tell her. Oh, Rip, she said when he had finished explaining, you must be awfully careful. You know the Dakotas would like to murder you. It sounded like the little Beth Prather he had known ten years before. The Beth who had kissed him that tragic night beside the grave of publisher Rip. He looked at her quickly, and this time he saw no cold aloofness on the pretty face. Her eyes met his in a look that made his heart turn a flip-flop and his blood start racing wildly. Then he told himself that he was presuming too much that she could not have fallen in love with him practically on the spur of the moment. No, her interest was just the same as that which she would have had for any other puncher who worked for her, and under the same circumstances. Doubtless she would have said the same thing to Lou Cayley, had she been with Lou, instead of Rip. We'll be careful, he said. She had gone into town dressed in Stetson, silk blouse, riding breeches and boots. Now she steadied him from under a side of the hat as they rode along, studied his face the while he looked straight ahead. It was hard, that deeply tanned face, but there was stamped upon it character, forcefulness, and unflinching courage. He kept the firm chin well up, and sat his saddle in a way to command attention. Rip, she spoke softly after a while, I've wondered a lot about you wondered just what you had become during the years that you were away. Just what is this fellow Rip? Suppose you tell me all about yourself? He gave her another intent look, and again there was a sweet gentleness about her that made this pulse race. Then he told her about his life in Mexico. When he had finished she said quietly, You're a great man, Rip Campbell, greater than you perhaps know. Most men in your boots would have come back here and killed the Dakotas forthwith, but that would have been wrong. You loaned your marvelous gun skill and your shrewd experience to the sheriff, to get that whole gang in a lawful way. That was right. He said nothing. She changed the subject, then. Upon arrival at the ranch the two women immediately fixed something to eat. Old Lou Cayley told them, Well, ladies, this will be one night you won't need to worry none about this place being maybe raided. The whole gang of them will be off on some crooked business down on the Rio. That's right, agreed Rip. Besides, we'll be watching them, we'll keep ourselves between them and this place all the time, so that even should any of them decide to come here we would arrive ahead of them. The sheriff will be watching those now in town. Heavily armed, the partners headed for the 4-H ranch. When they came within sight of the place they saw little signs of activity. As the day closed they worked their way closer and closer, until at last they were within 200 yards of the main building. Their horses well concealed there, they got down and hunkered. For an hour they waited and watched without noting anything of particular interest. And. Then the light in the main house went out. A blurred shadow appeared from the building and headed toward the corrals. Ned Dakota's heavy voice came to them. All right, boys, let's get going. Then the dull light within the bunkhouse flicked out. Men trooped from the long, narrow building and trailed toward the horse corral. Rip Campbell took in a whistling breath between hard lips and said eagerly, Well, partner, soon we'll know the answer to all our questions. Old Lou turned his head aside, uttered as but you. As he evicted tobacco juice from pursed lips. Then he grunted calmly, uh-huh. Soon a party of six men was riding away into the gloom, and every man was leading an extra horse. Now what the heck does that mean? Wonder drip. We shall see what we shall see, Lou returned quietly. But his thin, leathery face held a shrewd smile, as if he had witnessed this kind of thing before, in his ranger days. Carefully the two cowboys shadowed. They traveled parallel with the gang, keeping themselves constantly between those night riders and the Prather home. The four cage men seemed in no hurry. They rode at a trot, sometimes even at a walk. They passed off 4 cage range and over onto that of the shamrock. Say, I don't like this, muttered Rip. What are they doing on Beth's spread? Maybe we shouldn't have left the women there alone, after all. But I was not so sure the crooked business was in connection with the other side, on account of those pigeons. Don't get excited, cowboy. You're right. Lambert wouldn't have sent over a flock of birds just to tell the Dakotas that they should make war against two women. And if the gang is bound for the Prather place, how come all the extra hosses? Still, I'd like to know what they're doing over here on Shamrock Range, Rip mumbled. The range of the Prathers reached right down to the Rio Grande, 
as did that of the Dakotas. The band of men whom the two cowboys were shadowing moved deeper and deeper into the very roughest part of the shamrock spread. Ominous shadows they were as they moved leisurely through the gloom. They seemed to be floating through the purple night like devil ghosts. The somber atmosphere was charged with mystery and threat. The six gunmen rode, down into a rocky basin, and there they halted. Rip Campbell and Lou stopped, too. They dismounted, dragged rifles from scabbards, and slunk swiftly closer. They were eager to see what was going on down there. To their surprise they found. The gang sitting in a loose group. Cigarette coals glowed in the night, and a murmuring of conversation drifted up to the partners. Evidently those men felt pretty safe there on Shamrock Range. Looks like they're waiting for somebody, whispered Lou. Yeah, the rest of the outfit, most likely. The ones in town, I mean. Uh-huh, maybe we better move back to the rim until they get here. If we don't they might come up behind us and we'd find ourselves trapped. Yes, let's go back. We can see the surroundings better from up there. Fact, we can't see any of it except the rims from down here. They cautiously returned to their horses, and hunkered on the rim, with a dark thicket at their backs. For half an hour they sat there waiting, watching. Still nothing happened. The moon peeped, and filled the depression with ghostly light, showing the bunched horses, and the group of men still sitting patiently. A quarter of a mile to the west a sparkling streak of silver marked the course of the Rio Grande. All was very quiet and motionless. Suddenly Rip Campbell seized his partner's rail-like arm and pointed to northward. A band of riders had emerged from the night. They streamed over the rim and down into the rugged bull. Now we shall see, whispered Lou. They had extra horses, too, you noticed. The men on the ground got up quickly. One of their number called out boldly, and a reply came back. I reckon they felt pretty safe in throwing the challenge, since they ain't done nothing yet, observed old Lou Cayley. A posse would have had nothing on them. The two bands soon mingled into one. The men stood around talking for a while, and then there were signs of activity. They swarmed all about the place, some moving methodically back and forth between the horses, and what appeared to be the mouth of a cave. They're loading something, whispered Lou. Shall we go closer and try to find out what it is? Rip Campbell did not answer, for at that instant came a low, harsh voice which froze both him and his partner. Don't move, or we'll shoot you to rags. They were hunkered with arms folded, and they dared not move their hands as they heard footsteps behind them. The next moment their rifles were slid from their laps and their six guns were whisked away. The same harsh voice ordered, now get up and turn around, with hands lifted. They followed instructions. He and Lou peered intently at four men who had slipped out of the brush behind them, the next instant the man with the harsh voice said flatly. Hell, boys, that's Rip and his partner, Kaylee. Give them back their irons, Henry, then we'll hurry on with our business. He came closer and they saw now that he was one of John Nelson deputies. When we saw you hunkered there we thought you might be guards for that outfit below. We're throwing a gun ring around them. You two fellows can stay here. I'll finish distributing my squad along the rim. At the right time the sheriff will holler a command for the gang to surrender. If they show fight, let them have it. A moment later he and his companions had faded into the night. Fifteen minutes of tense waiting, while the activity went on below and then the heavy voice of John Nelson boomed out with startling suddenness. In the bull there. A posse has you covered. Come out, one man at a time, hands high and unarmed. If any of you start shooting. At first every outlaw had been stunned at sound of that familiar voice, but now there was wild commotion. Men were scurrying, grabbing bridle reins, vaulting into saddles, cursing, shouting. And then all hell broke loose. Chapter 12 it was trapped buscaderos who commenced that dreadful battle. Hoping to shoot their way clear, they began blasting away, despite the sheriff's command for them to surrender and the accompanying threat. Immediately then, the Pazeman cut loose, and the desperados found themselves ringed with gunfire. Rip sprang to his feet and started down the slope. Lou Cayley lurched up and yelled at him. Hey, you locoed maverick. Where you think you're going? To get the Dakotas before somebody beats me to it. I told you they were mine. I want the satisfaction of taking them personally. But hell, feller, you're going into a death trap. If the enemy don't get you your friends up here will. They won't know you from, ahhh. He broke off angrily, and went long-legging after the berserk Rennie. Rip stumbled and fell sprawling. The next instant Lou was sitting on him. This here hurts me worse than it does you, feller, he said. 
but I ain't going to let no part of mine commit suicide if I can help it. Evidently they had been seen there on the slope, for now bullets began kicking up gravelly dirt around them. Rip squirmed. Hey, you old fool, get off me. Do you want us to get riddled up here like two lizards stretched out to sun? Willing to use hoss sense, take cover and fight along with the rest of the posse's gun ring? Well, maybe a little ahead of it. Come on, hoist yourself. Let's get into this fight. The first wild surge of battle madness passed, he now realized the wisdom of his partner's advice, realized how foolhardy was the thing he had been about to do. A bullet splashed dirt in his face. Another whistled past Luke Haley's head. The old ex-ranger swore, scrambled to his feet, collared his young friend erect, and shoved him behind a lump of broken rock that lay on the gentle slope. Hunkered there side by side, they began plugging away at the scurrying forms down in the basin. It would have been a moment of nerve-jangling horror for a person wholly unaccustomed to battle. Six guns popped and rifles crackled, bullets snapped like firecrackers, thudded or spatted as they struck. Those which glanced screamed like fiends gone mad. Muzzle flames streaked and splashed and bloomed in the darkness. Horses neighed wildly some squealed when struck by lead. Stones clashed under their pounding shoes. Mingled with all the other infernal sounds were the excited voices of men. The trapped ones were cursing luridly, shouting to one another some crying out when hit. Many of those death yells were like the cries of wounded animals. And all the time the gun ring was closing slowly, surely. Rip Campbell and his pard quit the shelter of the big lump of rock, separated, and began working their way down the slope. They ducked from cover to cover, kept up their fire. The old ex-ranger was as calm as if he were merely engaged in some ranch duty. Rip's lips were drawn back in what was half a snarl, half a wicked smile. His keen eyes kept darting glances about, searching among the rushing. Forms for two that might be Ned and Cal Dakota. Suddenly two of the riders who were trying to shoot their way out of the trap, broke from an arroyo and came tearing up the gentle slope in their direction. Rip and Lou were in the clear at that moment. The horsemen shot at them, but riding hard as they were they missed. The moonlight showed the faces of the horsemen clearly now. The partners saw that their immediate opponents were the loose-mouthed Tessie and Dax Bradwell owner of the Crazy Horse Saloon. Those two renegades were throwing down with their six guns for another try at shooting a gap in the death ring, but they had chosen the wrong spot for that attempt. Their opponents beat them to the trigger pull. Lou's bullet struck Desi in the face. The heavy body lurched backward in the saddle, rolled over the cantle, slid down the inclined rump of the horse. His big spurs twinkled in the moonlight as he did a complete somersault. He struck on his belly, boots down slope. He slid for a little way in the loose dirt and gravel, hands and face buried. Then he stopped and lay still, a dead man. Rip's death pellet had bored entirely through Dax Bradwell's body. That slim, immaculate form stiffened. His gun swung downward, but he held on to it. His face was an awful sight under the ghostly illumination shed by the moon. It was rigid, strained, agonized and surprised. The eyes were popped wide, and they stared glassily ahead. The mouth was open, and dark streams suddenly gushed from its corners. Sitting stiffly like that he rode straight past Campbell, so close that his right stirrup almost brushed the cowboy. Rip raised his rifle to fire again. But he didn't have the heart, since Bradwell was unable to bring up that dangling right arm. Suddenly the downward pointing six-shooter fell to the dirt. Bradwell's mount, rabbit hopping up the slope, caused him to be unseated. T. He pony turned to avoid a tiny cedar. Bradwell pitched off sidewise, struck on one ear. There was a soft crunching sound and his slim neck suddenly had a grotesque angle in it. The next instant the body was tumbling like a sack of loose rags. The two riderless horses plunged on and disappeared over the rim. Rip and Lou went on, slipping, muttering, shooting, as their high heels dug into the loose earth. Old Lou spat tobacco juice and swore when a bullet cut a hole in his flapping vest. And now the gun ring had closed into the floor of the depression. Some of the outlaws were beginning to yell that they would surrender. Others were still cursing madly and fighting, some on horseback, some holed up among boulders and bushes. Rip Campbell recognized the hoarse voice of Ned Dakota as one of those which was profaning the night. Once more gun madness swept through him. Wheeling away. From his part, he went running toward the spot from which those bellet oaths were coming. He crossed a tiny arroyo, tore through a thicket of greasewood, then stopped short. Ten yards away was Ned Dakota, pinned to the ground by a dead horse. The burly ranchman was striving desperately to free himself. Rip Campbell experienced a letdown. 
Here was anti-climax. He stood there wondering swiftly what to do about it. And then with a start he saw that Ned had got free and was scrambling erect. The big man turned and saw the wiry young cowboy standing looking at him, rifle in hand. The fellow jerked as if from a slap in the face. For just an instant the two looked at each other without saying a word or moving a muscle. Then Ned Dakota swore heavily and sent a hairy hand diving for the colt at his thick right leg, the colt that had slain Mort Campbell. With his Winchester at his hip Rip waited until he saw the pistol rising. Then his steel spring right thumb simply flipped the hammer of his weapon. The forefinger was holding back the trigger, but a cold shock went through him when he heard only a dull click. In the fever of battle he had not kept count of his shots. The magazine of the rifle was empty. Ned Dakota's gun was pointed straight at the cowboy's heart now, but he did not fire. He had heard that metallic click, too, and he came slowly forward, a grin on his usually scowling face. Thanks for coming to my rescue, Rip, he said. You're going to be my shield until I get out of this place. Rip knew that if this scheme worked, the brutal Ranethman would kill him as soon as the fellow was in the clear. Moreover, the thought of aiding Ned Dakota to escape, even under gun force, was acid to his soul. He told himself hotly that he would die first. Put up your hands, Ned told him. Rip Campbell dropped the empty rifle, but his hands did not go up. Instead they flicked to the pair of colts at his slim hips. That fast draw was practically invisible there in the moonlight. Perhaps it was only the pantherish swerve of his body aside that caused Ned to press trigger. The pistol belched flame. Rip felt a tearing pain under his left arm. The very short colt in the cutaway holster, the colt with no trigger and no sight, the colt which was a product of his study and practice in gun science, beat his left one out of leather. As it popped there was a thud and the front of Dakota's shirt twitched sharply. The bull of a ranchman fired again but he was stumbling backward from the impact of that blow in the chest. And his slug missed the cowboy's right cheek by an inch. Now with his lips twisted grimly, Rip Campbell fired what was for him a deliberate shot, and it was from the old Frontier model cult that once had belonged to Mort Campbell. A black dot flicked into existence on Ned Dakota's broad crag of a brow. A whispered, sobbing sound came from his open mouth, and the burly form just seemed to melt came into a heap. Rip stared at the gun in his own left. Handon said huskily. That settles the score for you, Uncle Mort. Now I've got one to settle for myself. Again he flung glances about. Men were swarming everywhere, but they were Pazemon. These outlaws who were on their feet had their hands in the air. The firing had abruptly ceased, except for an occasional outburst of it where some cornered renegade refused to surrender. Dead and wounded men were scattered about the battle scene. There was a babbling of voices, as posse roughly handled captives. Rip Campbell found Sheriff John Nelson. I got Ned Dakota, he clipped out, but how about Cal? I'd like to settle with that Jasper personal. Several shot their way through. Maybe he was one of them. Leastwise I haven't seen him among the captives or the fallen. Rip's jaws clamped hard and he swore under his breath. The sheriff added. The boys are mopping up. We'll soon know whether we got him or not. I don't know about Dax Bradwell, either. He was with the band we trailed out of town, but. I finished Bradwell, snap trip. Then he hurried away and began searching among the dead, the wounded, and the captives for Cal Dakota, but he did not find that hated enemy of his. He thought swiftly. Where had Cal Dakota gone, in case the fellow had escaped the trap? Not to the 4K ranch, for Pazemon were certain to hurry there in search of him. Perhaps not to Pie Clambert's dive on the other side, either, since people would suspect that he had fled there. Where, then? He ran into Luke Haley and Judge Hugh J. Alberts, who had joined company. Look, said the old ex-ranger, and he pointed to some brand new rifles that were scattered about, others packed on a horse which he had captured. They aimed to run the guns across tonight. The Foxy Dakotas knowed their own ranch was under suspicion by all honest folks, and might be searched at any time, so they hid the guns over here on the brother spread. Nobody would ever suspect Beth and her mother of smuggling. And if by chance the rifles were discovered, Nobody could prove that the Dakota Bradwell crowd put them there. He jabbed a thumb toward a bound captive who lay a short distance away. Yeah, that feller over there told us about it. Judge Alberts rubbed his bulbous nose and said. The evils of this world are incomprehensible. TSK. 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 Now when I was on a judge's bench down in. The only bench you ever sat on, Lou cut in acridly, was alongside a card table. Rip Campbell paid no attention to their exchange of banner. He had wheeled away from them and was striding swiftly to the bound captive. 
he dropped onto one knee and said. Listen, fella, you've confessed part, because you figured it was now all as plain as day to us anyway, maybe. But if you'll tell me where I might catch up with Cal Dakota I'll ask the sheriff to make it as easy as he can on you. The captive licked his lips, hesitated. Come on, Rip urged fiercely, and shook him. The Dakotas wouldn't shield you. Old Ned is dead and the whole gang busted to hell anyway. Cal Dakota never poked his head through a noose to help you or anybody else at any time, did he? No, I'll bet he didn't. Then why don't you maybe help yourself a little right now, by telling me where I might find Cal? I can see you've an idea where he went." The captive said slowly. Well, I wouldn't say this, only, tough as I've been, I'd never make war on women. If I can help to save these two. Rip stiffened and he thrust his face close to that of the outlaw. Do you mean that he has gone to the Prather Ranch? The fellow cringed before the tigerish ferocity of the lean visage above his own. Very likely, case he shot his way clear. When Hal busted loose he yelped to the gang. That girl did hear what Desi said to Jenks about the colored pigeons coming over, and are riding tonight, after all. She tipped the sheriff and the posse trailed us here. Damn her, if I get out of this trap I'll, the heavy gunfire drowned the rest of his words. Rip's wiry form jerked erect. Uttering a funny, inarticulate cry, he went tearing away into the night. Gone at that instant was all thought of everything except Beth Prather, her danger, that he must save her. He was a wild man just then. Well. What the heck's the matter with that cowboy? Lou Cayley blurted in surprise. Um, I wonder? Echo Judge Alberts. He promised to speak a good word to the sheriff for me if I'd tell him something, called the captive. And now, how do I know he won't be killed if he tangles with Cal Hammer? Eh, what's that? Asked the judge, and he went quickly to the bound man. Lou followed. The outlaw repeated what he told Rip Campbell. Judge Alberts' usual political manner fell away from him like a discarded cloak. His voice rapped sharply as he said. We must follow him quickly, Lou. As this bird says, Dakota might kill Rip. Then what would happen to those women, and their ranch buildings? Old Lou spun on high heels, bawled to the sheriff the information which he and Alberts had just got from the captive at their feet. John Nelson began shouting crisp, clear-cut orders. Some of the men remained at the scene of battle others went rushing for horses. But by this time Rip was well away, and riding like mad. Chapter 13 the breeze whistled about Rip's ears, and turned back the front of his hat brim. His face was like one chiseled from brown marble. Silently he was praying that he would not be too late. There was no telling just what Cal Dakota meant to do. But despite the emotions that stormed within him, the cowboy gave close attention to his riding. He kept a firm, sure hand on the reins. It was dangerous business staring along at such a clip by night in that wild country. He passed the spring where he had first met Judge Hugh J. Alberts. The place was dark and lonely now. He thundered on and came to a hill crest from which he could see smudges that were the 4-H ranch buildings, far away. There was but a single gleam of light at the place. He cursed the ranch and rolled his horse anew. The animal was breathing heavily by this time, but Rip, lover of horses though he was, could show the poor creature no mercy. There was too much at stake, the whole world, as far as he was concerned. On and on he rode, weaving through the brakes, taking all kinds of chances. Rocks clashed sharply beneath the steel shoes of his mount. He breathed a sigh of momentary relief when finally he came out into level country. A few minutes later he broke from a forest of scattered mesquite and saw a steady glow of lamplight ahead, the Shamrock Ranch. And still he had seen nothing of Cal Dakota. Had he passed the Mad Wolf somewhere in the breaks? Had he beaten the fellow there? He could only hope so, and right on. His mount was blowing like a bellows. The corrals loomed out of the darkness, a lacework of shadow. He streaked past them, and had his first clear view of the forepart of the main dwelling. He uttered a groan when he saw a saddled horse standing at the gate, saw that the front door was wide open. Cal had got there ahead of him. Rip knew that the side of the paling fence before him was very weak. He had been intending to mend it soon. Now he was glad of that weakness. He drove his mount straight at it, crashed through, sent panels scattering like kindling wood. As he flashed by a corner of the house he made a flying dismount. It carried him bounding to the door. He went over the threshold, a six-gun in each fist. As he did so he heard a sharp command. Drop those guns. In one flashing glance he saw Cal Dakota shielding himself with Beth Prather, whom the fellow was holding pressed closely to him. She was not struggling. Her bosom was rising and falling swiftly. Her face was ghostly white, her eyes startlingly dark in comparison. Mrs. Prather lay unconscious on the floor. You dirty dog. 
Rip ground out. Cal's voice came again, like the yapping of a coyote. Drop them quick. Or I'll kill you. Rip Campbell saw nothing to do but obey. He couldn't fight, not with Cal holding Beth as a shield. With a sickening sense of failure in his heart he dropped his guns to the floor. Cal Dakota had escaped the gun trap back in the brakes, wholly unscathed. All during his hard ride to the Shamrock he had been cursing within his black heart, and planning fiendish things. But as he had approached the ranch his usual calm, devilish cunning had taken the place of wild rage. He must be careful, lest he run into a hail of lead. His hard eyes noted that there was no light within the bunkhouse. He went on toward the main building, his horse moving at a walk now, and he kept shooting glances about, as wary as a lobo. At the front gate he drew rein, sat his saddle for a moment, listening, peering. Then he slid to the ground and went tiptoeing down the walk. The window shades were only partly drawn. He slunk to a window and looked in, saw Beth Prather and her mother in the parlor alone. Fierce hatred rushed like a storm through him as he looked at the girl. She had made a fool of him, then betrayed him and the rest of the gang to the law. Well, she would suffer, plenty. He cat-footed to the front door, suddenly threw it wide and stepped into the house. The two women gasped and started up out of their chairs. Beth flung a hand to her lips and stared at him in horror. Mrs. Prather trembled from head to foot and put a hand onto the table to brace herself. What are you doing here? Beth choked out. His lips curled in a sneering smile. The scar on his left cheek throbbed alternately red and pale. You ought to know, he said in a voice that fairly dripped with threat. I escaped the little death trap tonight. I thought I'd pay you friends of mine a visit before hitting the long trail. And by the way, it might interest you to know that I won't just have to give up the four cage. It'll be handled for my benefit by others. Neat arrangement, huh? He chuckled mirthlessly. For a moment he stared at them, his hard blue eyes those of a triumphant devil enjoying watching victims suffer torture. Then in a grinding voice he deliberately began telling them what he meant to do. There won't be a building left, he rasped. When he had finished, Mrs. Prather expelled a long deep sigh, closed her eyes and sank to the floor. As Beth rushed to her mother she looked aside at the grim-faced torturer and sobbed out. You monster! You mad wolf! She knelt beside her mother, felt for a pulse, said huskily, Thank heaven, she only fainted. Cal Dakota had jerked up his head, was listening like a keen-eared beast. Beth listened, too. From out the night came a sound of hoofbeats, drawing steadily nearer. His right hand on his six-shooter, crouched, a fierce, killer look on his face. Cal Dakota began backing slowly toward a dark room, then on second thought he went quickly to a window, peeped. Don't move, he told Beth, and waved his now drawn pistol toward her. I'm watching you from a corner of my eye. The next moment his mouth curled upward in a satanic grin. My hunch was right, it's your boyfriend. Ignoring his threat, she straightened quickly and flew toward the shotgun, racked over an inner doorway. She got it down, all right, but he was upon her before she could swing around with it. Cursing savagely, he twisted it from her grasp and tossed it into the next room. At that instant the yard fence crashed. As Dakota swung the girl around for a shield he said fiercely in her ear, I'll kill him if you scream a warning or struggle. She had no idea what he meant to do if she didn't do these things, but there was no time to decide. At that instant Rip Campbell came catapulting through the open door. For just a moment the tableau held. Mrs. Prather unconscious on the floor, Cal Dakota pressing Beth to him, a gun jutting past her right side. The cold-eyed devil and Rip stared at each other with infinite hatred. And then again Cal's mouth turned up at the corners, causing the ugly scar on his cheek to wrinkle. He inquired, an insidious purr in his voice, Well, what do you think of the situation, Mr. Rip Campbell? I think that you're a yellow skunk for hiding behind a girl. Why did you come here, anyway? Rip was stalling for all possible time, knowing that some of the posse would arrive soon. Cal Dakota showed his teeth. To burn every damn building on this ranch, for one thing, Rip Campbell's ears were strained, but they could catch no sound of hoof beats. He knew this scene could not endure much longer, so he said. You've always paraded around as a ring-tailed tutor, Cal Dakota, bragged that you'd like to shoot it out with me man to man. Well, now's your chance, let me pick up my guns, or at least one of them. You put the girl away from me then, and we'll start smoking. Beth Prather's lips trembled and her eyes were full of concern for Rip, yet she offered no remonstrance against the suggestion. She realized that as the matter stood now, Cal probably figured on murdering the cowboy in cold blood, without giving him a chance to fight back. The other way, Rip might win, since he was said to be a flash with his guns. Dakota swung his head slowly. There was a faint sneer on his lips. Rip tried again to goad him into the match. Yellow, huh? 
A coward. I always knew so, you big bluffer. You're afraid I'd take you, just as I did ten years ago. The night I put that ugly scar on your cheek. Remember? The sneering smile on Dakota's lips widened. Again he wagged his head negatively. You can't work anything like that on me, Campbell. I'm too smart for you. Your game is easy to see. Then the mouth pulled down at the corners and the eyes became half-hooded. I'm not afraid of you and you know it. So does everybody else. For years I nursed the burning hope that someday I'd meet up with you and we'd shoot it out. You bullet marked me once, and I wanted to wipe out the humiliation of it, to show people I was a better man than you. I've been rearing to take you on ever since I found out that Kid Davis was in reality rip, but Dad held me in check. Said that there was no use taking a Monto man with you, or that at least I should wait until I'd have a mighty good excuse for such a gunfight. The law has just been itching to get something on us, anyway. Cal Dakota took a deep breath. His lips pulled away from his teeth, but it was not a smile, not even a mirthless one. Tonight I came to see things differently. It wouldn't be smart of me to gunfight you, and I've always been considered a smart man, Rip. They say you're lightning with your guns, and I might be killed. In that case I couldn't carry out what I came to this ranch to do. And that means a lot to me, Rip, almost as much as killing you. Even if I did kill you in a standoff. Once more Dakota grinned. Take her along with me until I'm safe across the river. I might run into Posse, and they'd hold their fire if I used her as a shield for myself. I'll turn her loose, eventually, and she can come back to her burned-up ranch. I guess you're wondering why I didn't hide in that dark room and drill you as you came through the door. In a straight-up gunfight, I might be so wounded that the law would get me, and then it would be a hang rope for me. No, Rip, it wouldn't be smart of me to shoot it out with you, not smart at all. I don't need to think of humiliation or pride any longer, since I'm going to leave this country anyway. And what about the girl? What do you aim to do with her? Asked Campbell front door. Well, I figured that would be giving you too easy an out. I wanted to make you squirm, to see the torture on your face as I talked. You know, the cat and the mouse? But now, I better get about my business. Up until now Beth Prather had neither spoken nor moved. She had feared that if she did either it would bring on an immediate crisis and she had given Rip every chance to outwit Cal Dakota. But now she began pleading in a half-sobbing voice. Don't shoot him, Cal. Please don't. I'll go with you willingly, do anything you say, if only. The heavy boom of his gun drowned her further speech. Rip Campbell rocked back on his boot heels. A slug aimed for his heart had struck him in the left shoulder. A killer light leaping into the hard blue eyes, a tightening of the face muscles and lips, and sheer instinct had warned Rip that Dakota was pressing trigger. With the pantherish quickness characteristic of Rip in moments of crisis, he had jerked his body to the right. The next instant he was diving for the guns which lay on the floor. As he did so he was vaguely conscious that hoofbeats were sounding faintly in the distance, that Mrs. Prather had moaned and stirred. Dakota tried again to kill Rip, but Beth was screaming and struggling now. His bullet ripped into the floor. He was a powerful man, and he crushed the slender girl against his big body so hard that she could scarcely move. Again the murderous colt swung down. By this time Rip had snatched up one of his own guns, the short one which had neither trigger nor sight. He flirted over as gun thunder shook the room a third time. This bullet, too, went into the floor, but it scorched his belly as it did so. The cowboy dared not shoot at the nearly hidden face or body. Beth might get in front of the bullet. But Dakota was giving no thought to his lower legs. One of them protruded out at an angle. Rip fired at it. There was a smashing of bone. The leg seemed to crumple, just at the boot top. The shock caused Dakota to loosen his hold of Beth, and she sprang away. Cursing in agony he went down, but he hit the floor still fighting. He wheeled his colt toward Campbell, started to thumb back the hammer. The cowboy fired while scrambling to his feet. Again there was a smashing of bone, and this time it was a wrist which was shattered. Snarling like a wounded tiger Cal Dakota reached for the gun with his left hand, but Rip was springing now. His right boot flicked out, and the gun went skittering. Standing spread-legged beside the fallen man blood further dyeing the left side of his shirt. Rip Campbell said, You deserved death a dozen times over, Cal Dakota, but I'm not a murderer. You didn't have a chance after I dropped you with that leg shot. Yeah, it would have been plain murder. Well, you'll hang anyway, so what's the odds? Cal said nothing, just glared at him. The sound of galloping hoofs was quite clear now. Beth cried softly, in mingled relief and horror nevertheless she hurried to her mother, who was just trying to sit up. Swiftly she told Mrs. Prather that the danger was over, and explained what had happened. Rip Campbell suddenly felt very tired, a little sick. Objects within the room were blurred, 
and they rocked in a circular motion. He stumbled to a chair and dropped. Into it, then he passed out. The cowboy had lost a good deal of blood from the wounds which he had sustained during the night. Two of the captives made complete confessions. They apparently felt no compunctions about so doing, since the gang had been caught red-handed, and completely wiped out. The Dakotas and Dax Bradwell had been carrying on all kinds of crooked business with the Pike Lambert gang. Cattle rustling, horse stealing, smuggling, border raiding, anything at all to make money. Wishing to be seen in each other's company as seldom as possible, Lambert and the two Dakotas had used pigeons as a method of communication. The white ones meant nothing at all. They were released frequently just to keep people accustomed to seeing pigeons in flight. But the colored ones did mean something. The signal was, are you ready? Or, yes, we're ready. For instance in this latest case, explained one of the prisoners, Bike Lambert had arranged to sell some guns to a hard-pressed bandit outfit, and he made a deal with Ned to supply them. When they were ready for delivery to him the Dakotas sent over a flock of the colored pigeons, with some white carriers added to guide, Lambert sent back a similar flock, which meant that Isavid and would be ready to receive the guns at a pre-arranged time and spot. It will be the last of Lambert too, he broke off. The Mexican government has been trying to land him for some time, for sneaking supplies to bandits and revolutionists. The man also admitted that it was Ned Dakota who had killed Rip's father years before, one night when a supposed horse thief had tried to get away with a fine stallion. Tejas was a buzz concerning the wholesale cleanup. Rip Campbell had been taken into town during the night, but he quickly had recovered from the effects of shock and blood loss. He was very much up and about the next day, although he wore a bandage around his body, and his left arm was in a sling. At mid-morning he stood once more beside his uncle's grave. Unbeknown to him Beth Prather had come into town. Unbeknown to him she had talked with Luke Haley and Judge Hugh J. Alberts. At that very moment she was climbing the little knoll to join him, Rip Campbell drew the old Frontier model Colt which had belonged to his uncle. He punched the cartridges from it, pocketed them, and then he stooped and placed the pistol carefully against the rock headstone which he himself had erected ten years before. There you are, Uncle Mort, he spoke aloud, you can have it back now for its work is done. Took guns, not editorial shafts to clean up this tough county. You know the old saying, fire with fire. But henceforth this will be a decent community to live in, I'm thinking. My job here is finished, too. I'm riding on, as soon as I've paid a last visit to the graves of my parents, out at the old place. The cowboy became aware of another presence, then. He looked back quickly and saw Beth Prather. She came quietly to his side and stood there, looking down with him at the grave. She held a big, flowered hat in her hands. The wind played softly with her dark hair and the spring dress she wore. After a while she turned to him, placed her hands on his shoulders, looked into his eyes and stated with calm frankness. You're not going away, Rip. I won't let you. Something in her eyes, something in her touch, the near presence of her, caused blood to pound in his veins. Boo, but, Beth, he said hoarsely, there's nothing for me here. I. Oh, yes, there is. This country needs you, the shamrock needs you. I need you. He just looked at her, long, steadily. Again she was an enigma, but not a cold, aloof one this time, a gently smiling one. Then she said softly. Do you remember, Rip, what happened here ten years ago? I kissed you, like this. She pulled his head down to her and kissed one of the tan cheeks. Beth, he said hoarsely, I love you. I know, she told him quietly. You have shown me that almost from the very first day you came to the ranch. Why have you been so cold? I didn't know what you might have become during the years of your absence, Rip. You'd taken on a new name, you carried two guns, with which it was said you were lightning. I didn't know but what may be in your suffering and your bitterness you had turned out law. And I had to know that the man I married was right. This time as he stared at her, his face, so long grim, cold, bitter, became almost beaming. She was smiling again, and her dark eyes were bright and tender. Beth. He almost shouted, and swept her into his embrace. She clung to him. After a moment he gently pushed her away. The lean face was troubled again. But, honey, we can't get married for a few years yet. You've got a ranch, while I'm just a cowboy without. Listen, Rip, she told him seriously, the shamrock is deeply in debt and in bad shape. I don't know whether or not I could pull it out of the bog hole, but you can. That alone would entitle you to share in the spread. She drew closer to him looked up again into his gray eyes. Well? Again he smiled, again he took her into his embrace. They stood there like that they knew not how long, his cheek pressed to her soft, dark hair. 
stood there on the knoll where all the town could see if it cared too. Gone now from the cowboy's breast were all bitter thoughts of the past. He was at peace with the world and supremely happy. It was a sound of hoofbeats which broke the spell. He and Beth moved away from each other to find two riders near, Judge Hugh J. Alberts, and Lou Cayley. We thought we'd come up here for the view, explained the judge, and rising in his stirrups he looked all about him. Lou chuckled. Rip Campbell noted the packed two saddles, and he said quickly, Hey, what's this? The judge explained. Well, things are so well settled around here, Lou and I decided we'd ride down into the lower Rio country where the political situation will be better for me, and he can go back into the ranger service. Yeah, affirmed Lou, this here country is all right for a married man, but she has become too tame for mavericks like us. He winked at the couple, then they all laughed. Good beasts were said, and then the two adventurers rode away down the slope. Rip Campbell and Beth Prather back there on the knoll, arms about each other's waists, gazed after them silently. The End